A love to bring her home. Written by Melinda Carlyle and published by Starfall Publications. All formats available on our website. Enjoy. Chapter 1 The knot in her stomach denied the shining sun and blue skies she could see above her. Beverly Rose Stutton. She straightened up to look at her grandmother as Ruth joined her around the table of drinks. The older woman stepped carefully around a bush, frowning as she clutched her skirts, the laces of her bonnet hanging around her neck. Ruth gave Beverly a stern look. What are you doing over here? Beverly licked her lips as she patted down her dress. It was a new dress that had been made for her just the other week. No, that was wrong. It had been made for her sister, Trissa. They were practically the same size. With a couple of hours of effort, it had been lengthened for her taller figure, and her own dress had been shortened for Teresa. There were birds singing in the trees, and it took all her courage not to wilt. I wanted to make sure everyone at the reception had enough to drink, Beverly ignored the catch in her voice as she forced a smile. And you? Would you like some lemonade? I made it myself so you know it's delightful. But her grandmother only frowned on the happy day. You're a terrible liar. I raised you better than this. Clapping a hand on the woman's hand that now squeezed her wrist, Beverly forced a tight smile. I know, grandmother. But today is not about me anymore. I, I am more than happy to give way to Trissa. They froze when Trissa looked over and waved. The two of them nudged each other before using their free arms to wave in return. Trissa, the shorter of the Stutton girls, made a silly face before hurrying off after her beloved. Richmond's doctor, Sergio Marghia, was dressed in his fresh, pressed suit. From where Beverly stood with her grandmother, they could only see the back of his head. But it was a lovely head. This isn't how I wanted it, Ruth huffed. Then she sniffed delicately and patted her forehead. Are you certain you're all right? Beverly wasn't certain what that meant anymore. She hadn't been able to sleep at all for the past couple of nights. Between all of her sewing and the rush to change everything for the wedding, she wasn't entirely certain what was going on. Only that Teresa had married Sergio, and she hadn't. I think I'm going to be sick, she announced. When Ruth stepped back in alarm, Beverly turned around and started walking. She needed some time to think. It was a brisk walk as she tapped her fingers against her skirts. Soon she reached the edge of the sidewalk at the park entrance. People nodded her way but didn't urge her to join their circles. No one would say the words. Part of Beverly appreciated that no one would say it. There was a sour taste in her mouth as she left the park and wedding reception behind. Taking a deep breath, she raised her head and embraced the noise of Richmond. As she reached the market, people were shouting and laughing and singing. Horses and carts and shops were everywhere. It was even more colorful than the park. Soon her deep breaths were helping as she allowed herself to be distracted. There was finally respite. Forgetting her large bridesmaid dress, she wandered through the market and thought of all the other things she could have. Perhaps new lace, or another dress, or a book. She could always settle down with a book or the newspaper. The Matrimonial Times. Ignoring the tightness in her stomach, Beverly opened the strange little booklet. At first, it looked simply like a booklet for couples. With more time, swishing her skirts with her hips, she learned that the booklet was for people looking for marriage across the Wild West. Strange, she mused to herself, but no stranger than what happened today. The more she read it, the more she considered her options. She had already done what good she could for her family. She'd saved her sister and former fiancé from a risky situation. After giving and giving, maybe it was time that she took something for herself. And then she could give that part of her to someone else. Like Benjamin Witten, 34 years of age, settled by Silver Springs in Colorado. He owned a large ranch with a mountain view. He offered a warm, safe home and security. That was more than she had in Richmond. A few months passed, and soon she was saying goodbye to the only home and family she had ever known. Beverly found herself on a train, looking as Virginia was swept away beneath her. She pressed her nose to the glass, laughing in disbelief. She could feel people watching her, but she didn't care. 
They were clearly not paying attention to the speeding world. Splendid, she breathed. She could hardly believe she was leaving her family for a grand adventure. Trissa had clapped for her, thrilled that she would be married as well. They were already in their early 20s and had been talking about marriage for as long as they could remember. Ruth and her father had been less than thrilled. Excuse me, is this seat taken? Beverly looked up to find a young woman looking nervously down at her. She jerked her head in a nod and patted the bench beside her. Please do, Beverly invited. Join me. I'm Beverly Stutton, just joined on in Virginia. The other woman glanced around before taking a seat. Her short blonde curls danced as she shifted about. Her cheeks were flushed as she held tightly onto her bag. Thank you, Miss Stutton. I'm terribly sorry. Only I embarrassed myself in the last car. Sandwiches went flying everywhere. I believe a cucumber landed in someone's hat. She sniffed before managing a tight smile. I'm Nancy Herkins, by the way, from New York to Colorado myself. Beverly brightened. Fine company indeed. The scenery was forgotten as she offered a friendly grin. Don't you worry about a thing, she assured her, but you must tell me absolutely everything about this disaster. I must know every detail. Who was startled the most? Were there screams? The two young women chattered away easily for hours before a comfortable silence settled. Beverly was exhausted, but there was too much to see. Such a strange world, she said aloud. Then she glanced back at Nancy. Why, I feel like we're going to fall off the side of the world. It does, but we won't. I've been to Colorado before, she pointed out. I grew up there. Beverly's eyes widened before they narrowed. Leaning forward, she gave her most impish smile. Perfect. You must tell me everything. The girl rambled on until Beverly cocked her head and asked her directly, Where exactly will you be in Colorado? Silver Springs, of course, Nancy blushed. Oh, it's lovely. The mountains and the valleys and the rivers. We do have springs. Well, they're really a river, along with a few springs. It's... She trailed off and then fell silent. Beverly watched as the girl shifted in her seat and glanced away for a minute before gathering her breath. Go on, she urged, curious of what she was missing. Then she announced the surprise. I'll be there myself, so we shall be neighbors. Nancy jumped. You'll be there? That's so exciting. Why, I think, well, whatever are you doing there? Oh, I'm sure I'll know exactly where you'll be. I can't think of any place I don't know as well as the back of my hand. Lovely, Beverly grinned before sticking her chin out with a friendly hair toss. I shall become Mrs. Benjamin Witten before the next day is over. I'm marrying a rancher. You know him? The other woman opened her mouth in surprise. She blinked at Beverly several times before glancing down at the bag in her hands. Beverly wondered what she had said that made the girl act in such a manner. Was it the marriage? Was it the man? That's... Well, are you certain? Nancy asked hesitantly. I am, Beverly nodded before scooting closer. What is it, dear? Is there something wrong about me? About him? You seem to know the name. The young woman shook her head before loosening her grip on the bag. It slipped to the ground and she grabbed for it clumsily, breathless before turning to answer Beverly. No, not at all. That is, perhaps. I'm not certain. Well, he's in the middle of a terrible situation, you see. He's claimed land that my father is desperately trying to use for his ranch. My father needs the river, you see, but there's another rancher, Briskin, that, well, I don't wish to gossip. I'm sure it's difficult, Beverly stated carefully, tilting her head to offer a kind smile. The West truly is. You haven't been home for three years, then. Is that what you said? Grateful for the assumed change of topic, Nancy brightened once again. She nodded hurriedly. Yes, that's right. I lived in the city with my Aunt Karen. I learned to watercolor and play several sports. I was hoping to stay, but my mother isn't well. She's never been well, but we're terribly worried. My father and brothers asked that I come home. I hate to leave the city, but I miss my family. There's nothing quite like being around the people that you love, don't you think? The question caught Beverly off guard. I suppose, she stammered. Again, she redirected the conversation to Nancy's family, hoping to learn more about Silver Springs. Her father was a good man. 
Ruth was tiresome, but inspirational. Trissa was imperfect, but sweet, and simply wanted to be adored. And Sergio, he was a terribly handsome man with a tender heart. She bit her lip, trying to get him out of her mind. If their relationship had been meant to be, then it would have happened. But it hadn't. They'd meant to marry four years ago when she turned 20, the age her father agreed upon. Except Margia had decided he wanted to become more than an animal doctor, so he left to receive medical training. He had returned four months ago, and they had finally set a date. She dove into wedding festivities to plan a grand celebration with everyone they adored and everyone who adored them. Yet two days before the wedding, everything changed. Trissa and Sergio had changed everything after one night. What was Beverly supposed to do? Pretend it didn't happen? Allow her sister's reputation to be tarnished forever? She wasn't stupid. Beverly accepted she might be many things. Impulsive, headstrong, playful, yes, but never stupid. So she switched places with her sister so that Trissa might become a properly married woman. Sergio hadn't even apologized. Remembering that, she pursed her lips and tried to hate him. She had spent the entire wedding day avoiding him or admiring him from afar. But she had sworn to herself that she would never talk to him again. That would make her life easier. As would this decision to marry a stranger in a faraway land. It sounded terribly romantic. Then her stop arrived. Nancy cheered, beaming at her before running off to find her family. This left Beverly alone to decide whether she got off the train or stayed. Ignoring the anxious fluttering in her heart, she licked her lips and climbed down onto the platform to find a strange world before her. Chapter 2 It wasn't that he had meant to spill the secret to his pastor, Darren Johnson. It was only that he needed his pastor's help upon her arrival. But now that he had explained he was getting married, the pastor's office had grown almighty hot, so Benjamin wanted to leave immediately. Except Darren had plopped down in his chair with wide eyes and a broad grin. The man clapped his hands to his knees in delight. Why? he proclaimed. Oh, that'll be nice for you. Wow. Benjamin shifted uncomfortably. He glanced away and fiddled with the collar of his shirt. I suppose. Are you available tomorrow, then? I am, Darren straightened up, still grinning. Good. He took a deep breath. Tomorrow, then. Benjamin grabbed his hat and turned to leave as the other man cleared his throat. Reluctantly, he turned around as his pastor fiddled with his hands. You're getting married, Darren stated, as though it had not already been said within the last couple of minutes. Benjamin glanced around the room in case he had misheard before giving a short nod. Before he could say anything more... The man continued, I'm glad. It's been a while. There haven't been a lot of opportunities for you here, but I'm glad. I recall the last woman. Sylvia, was it? Eight years ago? He tightened his jaw before forcing a stiff shrug. It was five years ago. Five years, eight months, two days. But no one cared. Darren stood up. He was still smiling as he put his arms down and then fixed a button on his shirt. Oh my, I'm happy for you, Benjamin. It really is about time. You have a great ranch and a woman there will be a lovely change. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about while we're here? No, I don't think so. If you don't mind, he added after a minute of awkward silence, I should go. There's still a lot to be done. When he took a step toward the door, the pastor followed. Good, good, he nodded. And when she comes, you'll be ready. You didn't grow up with parents, right? Benjamin worked his jaw before nodding. On my own since I was seven. My grandfather passed away in the Carolinas, and I've been working since. I don't see why that should be a factor. Upon the pastor's arrival in Silver Springs, Colorado, seven years ago, everyone had considered him a godsend. He'd brought the church back into better shape and had supported everyone during hard times. Well, you've never been with a woman, have you? The pastor started to ask him carefully. He immediately realized where the conversation was headed. Benjamin grabbed his hat along with the doorknob. I have to go, he announced and left without another word. Muttering to himself, Benjamin shook his head as he climbed onto his horse to head back home. Squeezing the animals back with his knees, they started off down the lane. 
A few folks who glanced up waved to him before turning back to their business. Benjamin wasn't stopped by anyone else as he headed out of town. Even then, it took the mile out of town for him to get Darren's words out of his head. There was no need for such talk. He could worry about wedded intimacy another day. The marriage was a pragmatic move, not an emotional or physical one. There were more important things to attend to, like his ranch. The river needed to be managed, and the ranch on top of it needed even more work. There were more cattle each year. It was hard work. Enjoyable work, but hard. There wasn't time to eat, not when there was work to do. That had been his grandfather's motto, mostly because there wasn't a lot of food. They hadn't had much, and they were both too weak to work when he was a child. Though Benjamin had tried to find work, his grandfather made him go to school. When the old man passed away, he had left town and started to travel. Benjamin found jobs wherever he could, working on steamboats and railroads and farms, until he started to save enough with a dream to settle for good. Then he saw Sylvia Behart. She'd smiled at him once, so he had stayed in that very town. He'd already been thinking about finding a place in the Colorado Territory. After that sweet, red-lipped smile with those dimples, he had scouted land and bought his acres off a man who wanted to head west for the gold. It had taken years of hard work, winters of only meager grub and summers with splintered hands, but he had a good ranch now. The hard work was paying off. While Sylvia had made him want to stop in Silver Springs on that first visit, it was the ranch that had made him stay. Sylvia had left, but he still had his land. He had made a home. Now Benjamin just hoped he was ready to share it with someone he had never met. There were more preparations that he managed for her arrival. Before he knew it, it was time. Benjamin paced anxiously before the platform. Every time his hands grew damp, he wiped them on his pants. Then he fixed his hair, put the hat back on, and tried to tell himself that he wasn't crazy. Mr. Witten? What is it? He hardly turned his head as he paced, fiddling with his hat before he jerked back to realize that it was a young woman who was asking for his attention. Mr. Witten, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Beverly Rose Stutton. How do you do? He noticed her lips first. They were a plump red that stretched into half a friendly smirk. The young woman gave him a nod and then a short curtsy. But she hadn't put out a hand to him so that they could shake. Then he remembered that women and men didn't do handshakes. But he couldn't recall what else they might do, not even for those about to be married. This was the woman he was going to marry. His hands started to sweat all over again as he studied her more carefully. There was still that smirk on her face. She only had one dimple with dainty, plump cheeks and bold brown eyes. Her dress had too much lace for his taste, though the bonnet on her head was nice. It contained a little of her dark brown hair that flowed over her shoulders. His heart beat loudly inside his chest. Benjamin furrowed his brow as he decided what to do next. He gave her a stiff nod. Good, Benjamin stated decidedly. The church is down Main Street, shall we? Then he started walking to lead her there, since she wouldn't know where to go. Putting his hands in his jacket pockets, he tried to think of something to say, but couldn't. Ah, of course, she scampered after him. He could hear her footsteps hurrying to catch up and continue to walk beside him. The young woman glanced up at him. He could feel her eyes on his face. He had never been married before. For some reason, he couldn't think of anything else as Darren Johnson and their justice of the peace helped him marry the strange young woman. He had never been married, and he didn't know what to do. As he dumped Beverly's bag into his wagon, Benjamin was wondering for the thousandth time if this was all a mistake. It's a lovely little town, his eyes skirted over to Miss Stutton, or rather, Mrs. Witten now, who shifted on the bench beside him and offered an agreeable smile. She cocked her head, tilting her hair in one direction to show her bare neck. He hurriedly glanced away. It is a good town, he forced himself to agree. The woman was not wrong. His wife. She was his wife. Gripping the reins tightly, Benjamin told himself to remember this fact repeatedly as he directed them out of town. Indeed, she nodded voraciously. Such quaint buildings. I've never seen anything like it. Silver Springs is a lovely little place. I'm sure I'll like it. 
The young woman gave a nervous laugh before swallowing loudly. When she glanced over, he shrugged. His shrug appeared to be enough of an invitation for her to continue talking. Beside him, she began to prattle away energetically as they traveled. She spoke about the weather, the trees, the mountains, the trails, and even the horses for the entirety of the journey. He stopped the wagon by the house. While Benjamin wouldn't say that he was annoyed with her constant prattle, he wasn't certain he was enjoying it. His eyes skirted between her face and the porch as he tried to decide what to do next. That's the house, Benjamin confirmed. He scratched the back of his neck, grinding his teeth as he tried to think of something more to say. They were now married. They were married to each other. It had been a wise decision, but now he didn't know what came next. It's a lovely house, Beverly assured him. Is this the ranch as well? How far does it go? The smile she gave him was charming enough that he found himself redirecting them from the house and headed into the valley before he knew what he was doing. She asked him one question and then another to show that she was listening to what he had to say. He didn't know how it had happened, but soon he was talking about his passion for the ranch. While Benjamin talked at a slower and steady pace, he explained what it was like to work with the cattle and how he took care of the land. When he paused to wait for her response on what he wanted to do with the ranch later, Benjamin realized there was a soft weight on his shoulder. He had been so caught up in his thoughts about the ranch, proud of his achievements, that he hadn't noticed how quiet Beverly had become. And now she was slumped against him with her eyes closed. If he didn't know better, he would suppose she had fallen asleep. He stiffened, not certain of what to do. Benjamin hesitated and then cleared his throat noisily. She shifted, but let out a soft sigh. Her eyes remained closed. The young woman looked peaceful, finally at rest. Now that she was still, he had time to consider his new young wife and what he had signed himself up for. The nerves in his hands had faded and they were no longer sweaty. He could no longer feel the tightness in his chest. Benjamin shifted slowly, careful not to make her stir. Slowly, he led them back to the house. This young woman was nothing like Sylvia. That much had been made apparent. Just the thought of it made his stomach twist. No one would ever be like his Sylvia. Sylvia was shy and demure, patient and observant. Beverly was bold and impatient, curious and loud. He was still bewildered over everything that had happened. But now that she was quiet, resting peacefully there beside him, he supposed it had been a good idea after all. Maybe a marriage between them could work. Chapter 3 The house was bigger than the one she shared with her family. Or perhaps it was not. Beverly couldn't decide. Benjamin had set her bag down inside the house and then left to put the horses and wagon away. There she was left in her new strange home. Holding her bag up, she explored to get a better look at where she would be spending the rest of her days. Beverly didn't hold high hopes for any of the space. The kitchen had little to nothing in there. Even the front room only had two chairs and a table. The two hallways were bare. It was large, but bare, and boring. This truly was a bachelor's home, and possibly the worst one she could imagine. Though there was plenty of space that abounded in the house, especially with a loft that would require stairs, it wasn't being used well. Benjamin walked in. He scratched his neck, scraped his boots, and took a step forward. Only after that did the man glance up to find her at the other end of the hall, watching him. Well, he asked, it's the house. She supposed that was his way of asking what she thought of it. That was a poor question, but she decided to give him the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps he needed the help. He could be shy. Maybe that was why he had a hard time talking. It's spacious, Beverly drummed her fingers against her skirts. There's a lot of... potential. Though we'll need to make a few purchases, the sooner the better. He took a step forward with his brow furrowed. Hands on his hips, he shrugged. What type of purchases? For the kitchen, she told him pointedly. You need more plates, more forks, spoons... You only have one. We can't share them. Clearly, he'd never lived with other people before. She tried to recall what he had said about his past, but couldn't remember. 
but she didn't worry too much about it. She could get the man straightened out just fine. And we would need more for guests. You haven't even moved in, and you're already telling me to buy more goods? He asked her. You don't have them, she said pointedly. So yes, you need to buy them, unless you intend to make them yourself. We can't just share the single plate between us and our guests. We don't need guests, he frowned, but he took a slow step into the kitchen. It was one step closer to her. We will have guests, she corrected him with a broad grin. You have a ranch. Folks will want to visit. My family, perhaps. Your family. Our friends and neighbors. Benjamin dropped his eyes from her face to consider the table between them. I suppose a few more plates wouldn't hurt. She nodded eagerly, glad he was seeing reason. I'd say a minimum of 20 plates. You always want to be prepared. He raised an eyebrow as he crossed his arms against his chest. Twenty? Eight at the most. Anything more would be ridiculous. Beverly frowned. At least fifteen. Eleven. Wari fourteen. Twelve for thirteen. An odd number? He raised his eyebrow. She glanced down before picking up his plate. This would make fourteen. Then he offered a definitive nod. You already said thirteen, so we can go down to twelve. That will make twelve, so I will purchase eleven tomorrow. She couldn't tell if she had won or not. Beverly squinted at the man for a minute before deciding she could fight another time if necessary. This had to be a step in the right direction. Before she could think of something else to say, she found a yawn climbing up her throat. I'm rather tired, she said, particularly carefully. I think I'd best retire for the evening. Where shall I be sleeping? Benjamin dropped his crossed arms before gesturing down the hallway. The bedroom is there. Office on the right, door on the left. There's room for your things, he said as he led the way to the bedroom. Their bedroom. Ah, right. Beverly set her bag down in the wardrobe and then glanced at the bare room and the large bed. The man was around ten years her senior, so surely he knew what was to happen on a marriage night. Her grandmother had already explained it to her years ago, and she had thought little of it until now. He cleared his throat. I already addressed the topic of marriage. She nodded hesitantly as Benjamin continued speaking guarded words. I don't believe in love. I need help on the ranch, and I promised you a secure home. As for heirs and children, we can worry later. You may be older than some brides, but you still should have a few childbearing years. Beverly's face flushed hot immediately. I can't believe you would. That's rather insensitive, even to say to your wife. He took a step back then a step forward. But you agree? She bit her tongue, not knowing what to say. Right. Benjamin cleared his throat again. I'll check on the house and return momentarily. You can change in peace. He meant alone. Beverly changed quickly into her nightdress and climbed under the blankets. She closed her eyes tightly shut as she waited for her husband to join her. A few minutes later, she heard the door creak open and shut. There was shuffling before she could feel cold air momentarily with a shift in the blankets. When nothing happened, she opened her eyes to find the night setting in quickly. It was very dark there in Colorado, and cooler. She clung to the blankets, relieved they were so thick, but she couldn't bring herself to move any more in case she bumped into Benjamin. Though they were married now, it was too strange an idea to touch him or expect any familiarity. They had only just met. Again, she wondered if she was crazy. Benjamin had already proved himself to be stubborn, passionate about his ranch and nothing else, and more outspoken than he needed to be on topics that hardly concerned him. She was married to the man. No matter how many times she said this to herself, Beverly couldn't grasp the idea. There was too much to think about. Even though she wanted to fall asleep and forget she wasn't alone in a strange place, she couldn't. Beverly spent her whole night wondering what life in Colorado with Benjamin would really mean for her future. Her arrival had come on a Monday. Every day was a new adjustment for her. A few days passed before she asked to write to her family. That Friday, Benjamin set a pen and paper out in the study for her to use. Another fairly bare room. Somehow, she didn't expect anything more from him, having already made up her mind about her husband. Her father would scold her for acting so fast. Ruth would laugh about it. 
And Trissa? Sergio? What would they think? Beverly put her chin in a cupped hand as she fiddled with the pen. Usually, she would tell them everything, but now everything was different. Beverly glanced over her shoulder to the open window, wondering what they would think of him. They would admire his build. He was thin, but he had strong shoulders. She'd already seen him lift a few barrels. Beverly supposed he could lift a cow if he had to, and his hair was lovely. Benjamin's dark brown hair was a couple of shades darker than her own and showed absolutely no signs of thinning. Her father would be jealous. And Sergio, who was already balding in the back. There was that bitter taste on her tongue again. Beverly pulled out the pen to make a face at it before setting it down by the paper. She eventually found something to write, telling her family she was safe and happy. She delivered her letter to the post office the following day when Benjamin agreed, if a little annoyed, to visit town a third time for more purchases. I don't see why we need any more goods, he muttered when they walked over to the general store. Beverly couldn't resist rolling her eyes. They're not just goods, Benjamin. They're what make a home. We have a home, he retorted before politely opening the door for her. She beamed, straightening her shoulders before strutting in. We have a house. That is a structure that helps keep us dry and warm. A home is completely different. A home is the place that people visit, family and friends. He let her make the purchases, albeit while grumbling. All Sunday, she spent making rugs for the entryways and kitchen. For the next week, she sewed curtains for every window in the house. How long does it take to make curtains? Benjamin asked in bewilderment, coming home yet again to find the fabric spread all across the kitchen. She glanced up from an awkward angle, holding a needle in the corner of her mouth. A long time. He sighed, shaking his head as he stepped around the crowded room to grab an apple. I don't think that's necessary. Curtains don't offer any protection, do they? It's not always about safety and protection, she countered, grabbing the needle to speak clearly. Beverly gave him a stern look. I told you I'm making us a home. I already built the house, he mumbled, glancing around before starting out of the room. Instead of heading back outside, he moved down the hall towards the bedroom. Beverly was getting ready to tune him out when she heard a thump and then a groan. Why is the table over here, he called. Biting back a smile, she thought quickly, because it looks nicer there. Not when you're bumping into it, he pointed out. She listened to his footsteps enter the study, shuffle around, and then come back out. He was holding his spyglass in one hand and his hip with his other. She pursed her lips and glanced at the ceiling. It still looks better there. It's not like I tried to make the table bump into you. It was almost an apology, and he appeared to accept it with a soft sigh. Can you at least warn me next time? And we need to talk tonight about what it really means to have a home. All I see is this busy work without any results. Her mouth opened in astonishment. It takes time, she sputtered. Still on her hands and knees, she sat back to give him a look. You didn't build your ranch in one day, did you? She watched his eyes glance away before he shrugged. Fine, I guess not, but we should still talk about it. Fine, fine. Fortunately, by the time Benjamin returned to the house for the evening, both of them were in much better moods. He'd forgotten about his bruised hip and was covered in dirt and a grin. As for Beverly, she'd finished the curtains. Look at them, she insisted when he returned. Leaning by the nearest window, she stood on the tips of her toes to show him what the curtains would look like once they were finally hung. This yellow is going to let the light in. Isn't it lovely? It works so well with the wood and it reflects candlelight to brighten up at night. Nor does it detract from looking outside in case we are in danger or there's an emergency, she added hurriedly. Benjamin paused, cocking his head to look at what she had set up. He took a step to the right and then a step to his left. His eyes were focused as he studied the curtains carefully before sliding his gaze over to her. Then he nodded. You're right, that is nice. She nearly tumbled over in surprise from his agreement. Beverly beamed, grinning so wide that her cheeks hurt as Benjamin moved away to get cleaned up. She moved to fold up the finished curtains while he moved on towards the kitchen. Beverly swished her skirts in cheer. It was only a moment later when she heard a loud thump and groan. Beverly froze, wincing. 
By the way, she called as she tried to keep the panic out of her voice. I rearranged the kitchen. There was silence before she could hear Benjamin loudly clear his throat. I can see that, he said, but he didn't say anything after that. Her nose twitched as she held in a snicker. Though it took some more convincing, plus a juicy roast for supper, Benjamin agreed to one more trip into town for the final pieces she wanted to turn their house into a home. They argued over a few items, but she felt fairly satisfied with her victory. You like it, Beverly reminded him when it was all done. He shrugged, fiddling around with his chicken. It's nice. I'll finish this week, she assured him, and you'll love it. We'll have plenty of rugs, towels, curtains, and everything to brighten up this place. When you're done, Benjamin announced decidedly as he leaned his elbows near his plate while still clutching his utensils. We're getting you out of this house, or you'll never stop. She rolled her eyes but didn't say anything in response. He continued, So you're going to learn how to ride a horse. Chapter 4 When his rooster, Big Red, shouted good morning to the world, Benjamin woke up wide awake. For a minute, he just lay there. After a few deep breaths, he sat up and heard a shuffle. He turned to find Beverly Stutton Witten fast asleep. She had stolen his pillow again, now hugging both of them with her face partially buried. The corner of his lips quirked up. She was a ball of energy like a young filly. When she wasn't awake or talking, it was easy to remember how pretty she could be and just how peaceful. He didn't always like their arguments. The one from last night had not gone well. They had gone to bed not speaking to each other. It was a new day, though, so he decided to try and make things better. He supposed he could bring her a peacekeeping gift, like fresh milk, instead of giving it away every morning. He dressed and headed out. The cows greeted him as usual, and soon he was carrying two buckets back up to the house. I brought milk. Beverly whirled around as he plopped them onto the kitchen table. Her eyes were wide with surprise. Hands still damp, she held them awkwardly in the air as she glanced down to look into the buckets of creamy froth. Ah, uh, well, she clucked her tongue and then glanced up at him again. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now back to our story. It was a peace offering. Why wasn't she taking it? Can I drink it? He frowned in confusion. What? Or do we have to, I don't know, do something? Beverly leaned forward, sniffing it. Is this warm milk? Where did it come from? His brow furrowed. From the cows. They wouldn't... Where did you think milk came from? Whoa. She shrugged. The milkman? The milkman? Benjamin stared at her. We don't have a milkman in the middle of Colorado. Her lips quirked up to show off her single dimple. You're a man who just delivered milk, so I could say otherwise. Now do I have to cook it? Or water it down? I don't know what to do with it. You can drink the milk, Beverly. Exasperated, he threw up his hands and stepped back. It's safe. It's fresh. What else are we going to eat this morning? She shrugged. Eggs? I saw your chicken coop. He ran a hand through his dark hair, sighing. Fine. We can have eggs. So you had eggs but not milk in the mornings back in New York. Virginia, she corrected him. And we had both. But our milk came in bottles, not tin. I don't think that's very reasonable. Tin heats up quickly, don't you think? If you don't want to drink it, we can use it for butter, he suggested. I can grab some eggs from the coop. Beverly hesitated before shaking her head. No, I'll do it. I'll do it. I understand what you're trying to do. Let me do my part, would you? The eggs are just lying there, right? His eyes followed her as he grabbed the basket since he usually took care of this job as well. I can help. The chicken coop can be a... She waved him off before taking the basket. Don't you worry. It can't be that hard. Chickens are so little after all. Just take a seat and I'll be back in no time. And then she was out the door. Benjamin watched her with a tinge of unease in his stomach. If she didn't understand fresh milk, did she understand how to retrieve eggs from the hens? Hands on his hips, Benjamin moved over to the window that looked down to the chickens in the barn. Following the bold young woman as she went, strutting with her hips down the hill, he watched as she fumbled with the latch and shuffled in. 
It would appear that Beverly had never been in contact with chickens before that morning. She froze when they crowded around her and wandered in circles before heading to the eggs, only to get pecked by the hens still sitting there. He took a step back in reaction to watching her fling her arm out in protest after dodging a determined beak. Even from down the lane, Benjamin heard her yelp in surprise. He contained a laugh and continued to watch her curiously. Stop that, she scolded the hen. The gray one always had more attitude in the morning. Behave yourself, young lady. You don't need these anymore. Then she had to practically run out of the coop, and breathless, she made her way up to the house with her head down. Benjamin caught a glimpse of the frown before she looked up to find him watching her. He felt his lips twitch and ran a hand over his face to hide it. Beverly gave him a tight smile. See, I told you I would bring eggs. Indeed he coughed lightly before stepping out of the way to let her into the kitchen. Beverly certainly made every day interesting. Some were cheerful and some were not. But he tried not to mind too much either way. No one he had learned in his lifetime stayed forever. Though he meant to teach her to ride, other things required his attention. No matter what Beverly claimed, he did not push it off because he was a man and men don't keep their promises. There were other parts of business that required his attention, like his neighbors. Martin Herkins owned the property to the east of him, and he had been wanting to talk with him for some time. That was another meeting that he kept putting off, but he supposed if he could get it handled now, then he wouldn't have to do anything about it later. Somehow, he knew it wouldn't be that simple. Upon arriving in Silver Springs, he had purchased a large quadrant of land that was hardly being used. He had the edge of the mountains, a secure valley, and the best access to the springs themselves. Everyone knew he had the best plot of land in the nearby Colorado property. Briskin owned property west of him and had followed in his footsteps after learning how advantageous a ranch could be. The man had made himself quite a ranch and quite a name in the world of ranching. Benjamin nudged his horse along the trail quietly towards the Herkins' house. No one but Mrs. Herkins and her daughter Nancy were there. The young woman directed him towards a trail toward the river, so he followed it along. Around the sagebrush and oak trees, downwind two miles until he could hear the trickling water. He slowed his horse down to keep an eye out for movement as he started towards the edge of the river. Herkins! Benjamin called out. Here! Herkins shouted cheerfully as something splashed. Benjamin took his horse to the river's edge before sliding off to find Martin Herkins sitting on a rock with a fishing line out in the water. The old man glanced over with a crooked grin. I almost got one, a fat big one. I bet it was cod. We don't have cod out here, Benjamin countered politely as he walked up. It was only salmon. But I don't eat salmon, the old man complained. Then you shouldn't fish. Benjamin fixed his hat as he glanced around. If he had done his math right, they were currently on his land and not on Herkin's property. This wouldn't be the first time one of his neighbors trespassed on his land. It was a good spot to fish, after all, and he'd picked his land knowing it would be desirable for many reasons by many folks. It still rubbed him wrong. You wanted to meet with me, Benjamin reminded him pointedly, hoping they could get to the point so he could leave. While he wasn't eager to teach Beverly how to ride, even that would be preferable to having to tell his neighbor that he wasn't going to pick sides over a ridiculous feud. Herkins and Briskin had issues with each other before he ever came into the picture. They both wanted more land and more water and more money, and both of them wanted Benjamin to side with them. Herkins glanced down from his seat on the tall rock. Benjamin, I need you. I already told the wife I won't go to church until Briskin cleans up his act. That doesn't make any sense, Benjamin shrugged. The old man just shrugged his shoulders. I can't go to church with a sinner. I need to trap him, Herkins grumbled. Get him good. I need your help. If you can convince him to... Benjamin quickly cut him off. I told you, Herkins. This is your problem, not mine. If it even is a problem. Forget Briskin and focus on what you have, all right? You need to bring in the sheriff for this type of matter. Such a suggestion made the old man spit in surprise. Sheriff, what for? He won't do anything. He might. Benjamin tried to keep his voice level and reasonable. He could intercede and talk with you and Briskin, help you two start some peace talks. 
Uncrossing his arms, he straightened up to give the man a stern look. Go to the sheriff, Herkins. Not me, all right. And go home to your family. Climbing onto his horse, he left before the sputtering Martin Herkins could find anything more to say. Though Benjamin didn't believe there were any such words, he didn't want to risk the man finding them. He had once tried to help with the peace talks, but it had only involved being sent as a messenger for the men to offer shaded insults before he gave up. Benjamin, thank goodness! He jerked up, blinking as he realized that he had reached his ranch. Gripping the reins, his heart seized as he looked down to see Beverly, with wide eyes wielding his bloody machete. Benjamin blinked, wondering if he was imagining things. I killed a snake, she announced in a high-pitched tone. It was in the house. There was a big old... Come quick, I can't... Oh, it moved so fast. But then I got a chair, you see. And then it was trapped in the corner, but I couldn't... I couldn't touch him. What if it was poisonous? There was this knife by your guns. It almost bit me. I tripped, but then I got it. I got it, and its tongue, not mine, and... Benjamin slid down, trying not to panic, moving his horse a few steps back so she couldn't hurt him. His eyes glanced at her stammering lips before focusing on the large knife she was waving around to point at the house, and then him, and then herself. When she did that, he leapt forward and grabbed it from her hands. She didn't fight him on it. His mouth turned dry as he tried to take in what she was saying. As he grabbed her arm with his free hand, he looked her over to check for injuries as she stammered in confusion. She looked ruffled with her hair all over and her wrinkled dress. There was blood on her hands, but she didn't appear hurt. If anything, she was in shock. Just calm down, Benjamin demanded, squeezing her shoulder as he tugged her toward the house. Beverly, where is the snake? Are you hurt? Don't shake me, she stopped as they reached the porch. Her brow furrowed with a stubborn line. And no, I am... Before she could finish her statement, Beverly turned around, grabbed her skirts, and vomited up her morning meal. He took a step back, trying not to breathe in the smell. Beverly straightened up, gasping for air before she turned to face him. Though her mouth was open, no noise was coming out. Beverly? Benjamin asked her. Her breathing sounded even, so he decided she would be fine while he investigated the house. It turned out to be exactly as she said. The table and chairs in their kitchen were overturned. He found the snake, or the parts of it, in the hallway leading to the bedroom. What was left of the animal was a pile of blood and enough chopped pieces that he lost count. There was a mess and there was a stench. Those were both manageable. Benjamin walked out of the house, rubbing his neck as he considered the other variables. Potentially leaving his weapons out could be a bad idea. Or perhaps the other variable, his wife, needed to be trained. She was walking back and forth, her mouth still open as though she were trying to get the wind to steal out what must be a disgusting taste on her tongue. He watched her from the porch, amused and annoyed. Colorado was a dangerous place, he was reminded, so it would be best if she learned how to shoot and take care of herself. It looked a little clearer now that Beverly could handle herself out west, even if it was clumsily done. But with all their arguments and her impulsive nature, Benjamin wondered how they would get along for the rest of their lives. Was she cut out to be his wife in this wild world of his? Chapter 5 The snake was gone, cleaned up, and dumped far away. Thank goodness. She could hardly sleep after all that had happened. But fortunately, Beverly was distracted as soon as the next day. She could breathe more deeply, she could feel her tongue, and she was no longer stammering. Though there were a few sounds that kept her jumping around in surprise, there weren't any snakes. Beverly? Bev? I'm fine. Heat climbed up her cheeks when she turned back to her husband, or as he was clearly trying to present himself now, as her teacher. She clasped her hands behind her back and swished her skirts. I'm listening. I mean... His eyebrows rose skeptically before he pointed to the rifle in his hands. This is not a toy. Weapons are not a toy. Do you understand? I want you to understand before I let you touch my rifle. It's just a gun, she sighed, her shoulders slumping. I've seen them before. He was acting as though she were a child. Just because she had grown a little jumpy after a large snake had invaded their house, 
The man was talking slower and louder than usual. It was annoying her to no end. No matter how many times she told him to stop, he ignored her. A rifle isn't just any gun. They're all different and you can't treat them the same. What is this then? He pointed to something on the gun. It was gold and raised up above the long end. She tried ransacking her brain for ideas. Nothing came to mind, so she shrugged. A bottle opener? She watched her husband take a deep breath, the air widening his chest to fill his lungs. He looked younger as his dark hair curled over his brow and the lines in his forehead faded. His eyes opened to meet hers. It's not a bottle opener, Beverly. Not knowing what to say in return, she shrugged again. He would have to show her eventually. The trick to making her husband cooperate reasonably was to be patient with him. Beverly was learning. Give him a minute to breathe and then he would be fine. He was never breathing enough. With another breath, Benjamin explained the different parts of the rifle. There was a trigger, a sight, the barrel, and more. It was a lot to remember, but the smooth timber of his voice somehow made it easier for her to remember. I hold it like this? Beverly lifted the rifle in her arms in an attempt to copy the pose that he had just showed her. It wasn't as heavy as she had expected, though perhaps it helped not having a bullet in the chamber. He walked around her, his boots hardly ever making a sound. Beverly wanted to do the same to creep up behind folks like he could, but she hadn't figured out his trick. She'd even tried on his boots the other day, but had decided that they could be noisy with any effort applied to them. Her heart skipped a beat when he nudged her boot with his. Bring it out a little further. She shifted, wavering slightly. That was when she felt his hand on her waist to steady her. Beverly felt her mouth turn dry as his heavy palm stayed put, a weight on her skirts that she couldn't ignore. She blinked several times, losing focus of wherever she was supposed to be staring. His other hand touched her other side to slowly turn her. It was hardly an inch, maybe two, but that moment felt like he had sent her off spinning with the way her insides started to bounce. Beverly gripped the gun tightly so she wouldn't accidentally drop it. When she had done that with the revolver yesterday, they'd quit early out of his exasperation. Don't move, he murmured there in her ear. Benjamin was so close. She stiffened, not certain if it was from realizing his lips were nearly touching her ear or from an attempt to obey his order. This felt more intimate than them sleeping in the same bed every night. Beverly blinked several times again. She could feel her insides moving about like there were birds fluttering inside of her. Part of her wondered if they would go away if she dared to move, but then part of her didn't want to move. His breath was warm on her ear as he brought his hands around her from behind. While Benjamin's right hand settled the stock snugly into her shoulder, his left reached down her arm to tighten her grip on the barrel. Breathe deeply, he instructed quietly, as though he noticed nothing. Then again, he didn't notice a lot of things. But this was one instance where Beverly was beyond relieved to know this. She already felt so flustered that she hardly knew what she was doing anymore. All she wanted to do was lean back into the man's grasp. Aim at the target, Benjamin continued to speak softly, redirecting the rifle with his left hand on hers. Do you see it? Yes, she rasped, hardly listening to anything besides the timber of his voice. Beverly felt so lightheaded that it took all her strength to stay upright. Shoot when ready. She blinked, recognized the red cloth and pulled the trigger. Immediately, the days ended as the rifle kicked back in her arms. It had been easily handled with the revolver, but Beverly had already forgotten everything, and so she suddenly panicked. But he was right there. Benjamin kept his hands over hers, forcing her to grip the gun tightly. She stumbled back into him, caught off guard and confused. Though she tried to let go, she couldn't with his forceful handle on her. Ow! She groaned as she tugged to free her hand. He got the hint, but only by grabbing the rifle so she didn't continue to hold it. Not a bad shot, Benjamin told her. His eyes hardly skimmed hers as he pointed his chin toward the red cloth hanging in the trees. You made it. You bruised me, she started, but then turned. What? I did it. I hit the target. Squealing in delight, Beverly laughed and cheered. I did it. I'm a marksman. A markswoman. Hand that over. I want to do that again. 
The next week flew by as he showed her how to handle every gun and knife. Once situated with the weapons, then he brought her to the stables and pointed out his horses. Why doesn't he have a name? Benjamin made another one of his noisy sighs. She pretended not to hear. She was too busy staring at the gray horse in the pen. Because he's a horse, her husband said behind her. When she felt his breath curl on her bare neck, Beverly stepped to the side. This time, when her stomach began to squeeze, she took a deep breath and told herself to behave. She could think on strange feelings later. She threw her hair back over her shoulder to give him a look. Then she offered her most charming smile as a compromise before turning back to the horse. This one is Chief. Aren't you, Chief, you handsome man? To her utter delight, the horse nodded his head. If he gets fat or lazy, it's your fault, he muttered, before moving forward to open the padlock. Stay put while I get him saddled. Beverly stood as close as her husband would permit as he sat on the saddle and bridle. He explained the steps as he went, reminding her that she would be learning to do this herself. Put your foot there. Beverly inhaled deeply as she hiked her foot up to put it in the stirrup. That's so high. You'll be fine. Just put it in. And then I'm going to... What are you doing? Her eyes dropped to see where he was touching her. While she could feel his hands around her waist, she didn't know why they were there. The next thing she knew, he had lifted her into the air toward the saddle. Instinctively, she grabbed the pommel and soon found herself sitting on the horse. Breathlessly, she looked around from her tall view, her heart hammering against her chest. She had never felt so tall. Oh my, Beverly smiled slowly. Are you settled? He asked her pointedly. When she nodded, he moved his hand away from her leg and took a step back. She was riding a horse named Chief. Even though Benjamin told her pointedly that she would not be handling the reins herself, she still felt like a perfect lady sitting in the saddle. They walked around the barn and pen several times before her husband led them back to where they had begun. Already, she complained when they re-entered the stables. Trust me, Benjamin assured her with a wry smile. You'll regret staying on this long tomorrow. He was right. It was not a joke, and if he thought it was, he was a very cruel man. Beverly attempted to climb out of bed and immediately started groaning. She'd never known a soreness like that before. She took her time walking to the kitchen. When she reached the table, she found a pile of envelopes along with a package or two, the mail. Curious, Beverly sorted through them to see what had arrived. She hummed to herself as she shuffled through an open letter about some cattle moves. Oh, her mouth dropped open in surprise to find she had mail as well. Two letters, in fact, or more particularly, Mrs. Beverly Witten. Just as she mused on the strangeness of it all, she opened them. Checking the dates, she read the first one and then the second. They had been sent only three days apart and were both from Teresa. Oh, dear. Beverly read them over again, and then a third time as her heart began to pound. She tried to swallow, but her mouth was dry. This wasn't an idea that she had agreed to accept. The back door creaked quietly around the corner as Benjamin stepped inside. He pulled off his hat and nodded to her. How are your legs? But she couldn't contain herself anymore. My sister is visiting, Beverly blurted in a gasp, with her husband. While Benjamin was not nearly as anxious as she was about the sudden, impending event, he was cautious and more careful with his words. If anything, he grew even more reserved than when they had first met. It's your family, he explained to her. You know what is best. Then he left her to make all the arrangements. But what do you want? She pestered him, wishing he would say that he didn't want to have them visit. That way, she could force them to leave without it being her fault. Of course, she loved her sister, and Sergio was the man she had loved. Together, they had broken her heart. Beverly wanted to be happy for their life together, but she wanted them to be happy away from her, so she didn't have to see them. Otherwise, she had to face the constant reminder of their betrayal. She told herself that she didn't really care, that she didn't even want Sergio anymore. But seeing them only reminded her of what once could have been. Swallowing hard, she forced herself to prepare the loft. Stairs had been built and the room was made up for guests. 
Beverly cleaned every inch of the house, prepared all the delicious food, and brushed her hair over and over. She couldn't help herself. She had to be a perfect hostess, no matter the guests. They're just family, Benjamin reminded her on the evening when her sister and brother-in-law were expected. I know, but it's still family. She enunciated the last word with a pointed look before hearing horses at the front of the house. Her heart thudded in her chest painfully. Gasping, Beverly looked at him with wide eyes before turning to the front door. They had arrived. As thrilled as she wanted to be to see her family again, a sinking feeling entered her stomach and settled there. She did her best to ignore it as she put on her most winning smile and flung the door open to greet their guests. Chapter 6 He stood in the doorway for a minute before realizing he should help their guests. Beverly was already there, buzzing around the wagon he recognized from the town stables. His wife clapped cheerfully as though she hadn't had her brow furrowed a moment ago. It had only been a couple of months, but already he was learning about her moods. The impulsivity came from somewhere, often several places, like her anxiousness or her excitement or her fear. This time, he wasn't certain. You're here! Beverly hurried over to the front wheel. Come here so I can hug you, Trissa. Oh, look at you! I'll take the horses, Benjamin spoke up, not certain what else he could do. He stood by the horses and watched from a safe distance. Beverly's hair had grown longer in the short time she had been there, beyond her waist. It flowed around her like a soft breeze. The golden shades in her hair sparkled in the sunlight as she moved. Sometimes he felt certain that she only stopped moving when she was sleeping. Another young woman appeared, climbing off the wagon. He blinked, realizing it had to be her sister, his sister-in-law, Teresa. Teresa was shorter, rounder, and wore tight brown curls that hugged her chin. Her voice was shrill as she giggled before hugging Beverly. The two girls cheered happily, chattering away eagerly. Oh, look at you! Is that a new bonnet? Your hair has grown so long. How strange. I think I like it. How was your journey? Yes, I do like it myself. Such a long journey, but it was worth it to get here. I can't believe you did that all by yourself. Oh, that's beyond me now. You must come in. Did you bring many bags? Women, eh? said another man's voice. Benjamin turned to find another man standing beside him. He eyed the man with the black hair, trimmed mustache, and dust-covered white suit. Trissa's husband then, and now his brother-in-law. He couldn't remember the name. Beverly would have to provide introductions eventually. Women, he repeated. Not sure what the gentleman meant. The man shrugged. They always talk like that. You'd think everyone was family to Trissa the way she greets people. It's one of the silly things about the Stutton girls. The Stutton girls? Benjamin shifted before glancing back at his wife. He hadn't used the word silly for her before and was hesitant to use it then. Though she was talking happily, he noticed how her eyes kept shifting over to him over her sister's shoulder. Come then, everybody in, Beverly waved her arms about. I prepared food for everyone. As the two girls linked arms and started up the porch, the other man followed quickly. Benjamin remained where he was, watching them. Only Beverly stopped, glancing over her shoulder. That was when he gestured to the horses and then to the barn. Someone had to tend to the horses. She gave him a look, but she was too far away for him to read what it was. He decided to assume that this was exactly what she wanted and that she was definitely not annoyed. Chuckling to himself, Benjamin led the horses to the stables where he tended to them and the wagon before slowly making his way up to the house. It was a good house, a solid one he had built years ago, bigger because he'd once had big dreams. But he enjoyed the quiet in the wide open space. Beverly had broken that peace with her chattering and movement. Another adjustment, but he learned. With the arrival of more people, however, it felt like the Lord was testing him. There you are. Beverly appeared at the door, opening it for him. We were about to eat without you. Thanks, he muttered. He set the traveler's bags down beside him. Once Beverly had closed the door, she looked him up and down. Her brow furrowed. Then she reached up and jerked on his collar. 
Before he could ask her what she was doing, her hands swept over his shoulders to straighten out the wrinkles on his shirt. Her hands moved expertly down his arms, sending strange tingles dancing to his fingertips. His eyes followed her fingers as they pulled at his buttons and straightened his collar. She suddenly tutted. You're so thin, Beverly frowned. It helped his heartbeat slow to its normal pace. I'm giving you an extra large portion tonight. Not having expected her to say that, it took Benjamin a minute to catch up to her in the kitchen. Maybe you're just a bad cook, he commented, though it assuredly wasn't true. She snorted to share her own opinion on his bad joke. Benjamin followed his wife, slowing down to find the two usual chairs already filled. This meant he would have to sit somewhere else, and the idea made his stomach churn. Benjamin, please properly meet my sister, Mrs. Teresa Stutton Margia, Beverly offered the introductions at last, and this is her husband, Mr. Sergio Margia. Teresa and Sergio, please meet my husband, Benjamin Witten. Sergio was sitting where Benjamin usually sat. He stood awkwardly in his own kitchen until he noticed Beverly motioning to one of the spare chairs. It wasn't as comfortable as his own seat, but he was hungry and didn't want to be rude, so he took a seat and offered a tight nod. Welcome to Silver Springs, he said, not knowing what else to say since Beverly had said more than enough. I'm so glad to finally meet you, Trissa leaned forward with a mischievous smile. My sister writes so much about you that I've had all these little fantasies in my head. I almost expected someone ten feet tall. That's unrealistic, Sergio scoffed. Beverly nodded quickly. It is, Trissa, very unrealistic. Then she shot a side glance at Sergio before sitting. We need to say grace. Why, Sergio, why don't you say it tonight? Straightening up, Benjamin hesitated. That was always his responsibility. It had started as a joke between him and Beverly, but they had moved into the flow of the habit where he had started to enjoy saying grace every night. His eyes watched Sergio turn to Beverly and offer a dramatic nod. I would be more than happy to. Benjamin shifted in his uncomfortable chair, irritated as someone else said grace in his own house. This was his kitchen and his table, but for some reason he couldn't bless the evening supper. We thank our God in heaven for his goodness, his blessings, and his might. Deprive us not of thy heaven. Bless us these gifts. Amen. Thank you, Sergio. That was beautifully said. Glancing up from his plate, Benjamin saw his wife glance at the other man with a lingering smile until she realized he was watching her. A flush climbed up her cheeks before she looked down. Just for you, Sergio responded cheerfully. Benjamin felt his stomach drop. As Beverly led the conversation around their guest's journey, the food turned tasteless in his mouth. When he glanced up, he noticed his wife reaching for the potatoes, but when Sergio reached over as well, she jerked her hand back and turned away from him. Her eyes were bright as they looked away, falling quiet in the conversation. Benjamin glanced at Sergio to see if he had noticed the strange behavior. Sergio hesitated as well before pulling a grin on his face to say something to his wife, as though nothing had happened, but something had. Benjamin could feel a strange tension building in the room. Only Trissa behaved as though nothing had happened. I just think it's silly, Trissa was saying. I mean, don't you remember how the two of you tried to fly that kite in the park? It was only a few years ago. Beverly glanced at Sergio, who looked up. I don't remember, Beverly proclaimed loudly. I need more water. Anyone else? Benjamin? He searched for an excuse, suddenly anxious to leave the room. I have to feed... The horses. Beverly glanced around with a confused look. But we're eating, Benjamin. Can't you wait? When their eyes met, he wondered what was going on inside her head, but she clearly didn't want to tell him. He shook his head and left the table. There was nothing else he could think to say. As he headed toward the back door, he could hear his wife making up an excuse for him. He rolled his eyes, grabbing his hat, and slammed the door on his way out. The sun was setting before him, with dusk bringing in a slight chill. Ignoring it, he stomped down to the stables. Benjamin opened the door and paused, not certain of what to do next. The horses didn't need to be fed because he'd fed them before heading up to the house. He had nothing to do in the stables. But he didn't want to return to the house where he didn't know his guests well, and his wife wasn't helping the situation. 
Beverly was acting strange, and it was only annoying him. Hadn't he told himself to be careful? Sylvia had left him, too. His heart burned at the memory of the young woman. He could still see her shy smile and blonde curls. Sylvia had the sweetest face he'd ever seen, with a laugh that tinkled like glass. She'd been young, kind, and a humble young woman. He could remember meeting her like it was yesterday. Sylvia had come down the steps of the church wearing a bonnet with ribbons tied around her chin. She had looked over and caught his eye. Then she had smiled. Even now, his hands sweated at the memory. His heart skipped a beat, and he wondered where she was. He wondered if she thought of him. They had planned to marry. All he asked her for was a little more time. The house wasn't built yet, and his ranch was pitifully small. There was so much potential, and he wanted everything to be just right for her. She deserved perfection. But just as he had gone to buy her ring, Benjamin learned that she was gone. Sylvia Behart had run off with Mr. Anthony Laszlo, a southern gentleman passing through town from Georgia. Laszlo had only been in town for two days when they disappeared. With them had gone any hope of Benjamin's happy future. Alone in the barn, Benjamin paced. Beverly would never be like Sylvia, for they were much too different, and it was clear she didn't love him. He told himself that it was good, but somehow it brought him no comfort. There was an itch in his spine, and he wanted to shake it out of him somehow. He wasn't going to be put in the same situation twice to lose the women in his life. He didn't need that. Only he wasn't sure what to do. Beverly was the opposite of Sylvia, and he didn't even know what to think about her. Chapter 7 He seems nice. Beverly turned to her sister. Trissa offered a smile and a shrug before turning back to her food. The young woman was squinting at the beans and sniffing them before taking small bites. It made her look like a rabbit. He is nice, Beverly nodded hurriedly. She flipped her hair over her shoulder and put a smile on her face to show she didn't care that Benjamin had just walked out of dinner. He's wonderful. When she glanced to her right, Sergio was also nodding as he smiled at her. Their eyes met, and she felt her heart pound. He was such a handsome man. Without looking down, she tried to find some food to scoop onto her fork. Beverly thought quickly, trying to make up for her husband's rudeness. He built this house himself, she announced loudly. And the barn. Did I tell you that? It's beautiful, isn't it? It's quaint, her sister said decidedly after looking around. Rather rough. It could use some crown molding. Don't you think, dear? Beverly tightened her grip on her fork as Sergio cleared his throat. I quite agree. Most homes in the city had crown molding. They added a flair of sophistication without being useful. In Virginia, everyone thought they were terribly important. But as she settled into her new life in Colorado, Beverly had realized how useless they were. Shrugging, she glanced down at her plate. I'm afraid that's not the attitude out here. It's not something I want to waste my time on. There's already more than enough work. For example, I'm learning how to shoot. Forks clattered noisily onto plates. Beverly, seated with her guests on either side of the table, glanced between them with a furrowed brow. How ghastly! Trissa's eyes widened as big as her plate. Sergio scoffed, making a face before burying it momentarily in his napkin. His fine mustache twitched. Guns? That's rather uncouth, Beverly. That's not ladylike. Can't your husband protect you? Say how dangerous is Colorado? Caught by surprise, Beverly couldn't help but burst out laughing. They looked terribly ridiculous in their dusty city clothes sitting in her log house. Having gotten so caught up in her new life, she realized that she had never noticed how different her life had become with Benjamin and how she'd settled into a rather strange role. There were no more days wandering around town in city parks with performers and little shops when she was bored and had finished her chores in her family's home. Instead, she handled the laundry herself, managed the house alone, and was learning to run a ranch alongside her husband. It required a lot of learning. That often annoyed Benjamin, but even through his eye rolls and impatience, he taught her well. This life had to appear strange to those not used to the hardships of having so little to hold and so much work to finish. 
Beverly tried to think back to her first day in Colorado, but couldn't recall how she had reacted. She was fairly certain that she had argued with Benjamin. Then they'd settled awkwardly in bed side by side. But that had been it. After all, she had known she was preparing herself for a strange life in a strange place. What were you expecting? Beverly sputtered, giggling. A tear trickled down her cheek and she hastily wiped it away. Though she wanted to feel apologetic, she was having a hard time talking. It's the West. Sergio stood up, his hands on the table. The man towered over her. His face darkened as he gave her an intense look. Beverly, are you safe here? I mean, do you feel safe? Perhaps we should take you home. The sudden seriousness made her choke on her breath. Heat climbed across her cheeks. Beverly coughed and shook her head as she waved her hand. Any merriment immediately faded at his severe tone. What? No, Sergio, I'm fine. I'm actually very good with a rifle. She coughed one more time and then gulped down her water. Standing up, she gestured to his seat. Just sit down, would you? Why? The nerve of him. Smashing all her dreams of a future together, taking advantage of her naive sister, and then she had to be the one to convince him to do the right thing and marry her. She sacrificed herself and flew away to this wild and unknown place to avoid the pain of seeing them together, and he wanted to take her back. To where? Her personal hell. She looked at him severely. Sergio looked affronted, glancing between the sisters before obeying her. A lady such as yourself should be well cared for, Beverly. How do you sleep at night? I'm worried for your safety. If your father knew... Jerking her head back, she gave him a strange look. Irritation flooded through her body, itching her skin from the inside out. My father, if he knew what? This is my life. I chose it, and I'll do with it what I want. Sergio is only being reasonable, Trissa groaned in exasperation. You're acting like a child. No, I'm not. You dare to accuse me of acting like a child? She stomped her foot in frustration. Beverly caught her breath, caught off guard by how loud she was. But as she looked between her startled party, she decided she had meant it, and if she stayed, she might say a lot more. Upon this realization, she huffed and immediately turned around to leave the kitchen. She went down the hall, and without knowing where else to go, she went outside to the front porch. There was much more air out there. Inhaling deeply, she tried to understand what had happened, what was going on with her sister and Sergio. They were acting as though they knew what was right for her, as though they cared. If they had cared, they wouldn't have spent a scandalous night together just before she was to marry Sergio. It wasn't like they had to come to visit her. She hadn't asked them to do that. She hadn't said they should come, nor had they given her the chance to turn them down. That only happened because the postmaster didn't deliver their mail frequently. There was so much energy in her body right then that she had to start pacing, or she was certain she would explode. Groaning, Beverly balled her hands into fists. All she wanted to do was hit something or shoot something. There were so many emotions flooding through her veins that she didn't know what to even think. All her thoughts were moving too fast. Sergio looked so fine at her table. His nonsensical talk was less so. He still made her heart beat as though she were galloping on a horse, and he had been worried about her. For a minute, her heart almost softened. It was nice to have someone concerned about her, but the moment dissipated into anger once again. Then there was Trissa, her dear younger sister, her sweet, foolish little sister. No one came to talk to her. There was time to clear her mind. She was left alone to figure out her thoughts and her feelings and what she wanted. Sergio was a handsome man. Everyone in Richmond loved him for his knowledge, his fashionable appearance and cleverness. He was everything she had ever wanted in a man for the last couple of years. But now he was taken and not hers. Now she had Benjamin, tall, skinny, and strong. Benjamin, who had stomped off for no good reason at dinner to leave her alone, he understood that Colorado was a beautiful, untamed wilderness with homes that didn't require crown moldings. At least he listened. He didn't like to, but he did. And he talked to her with words that made sense. While he wasn't what she would necessarily call kind, he knew what he meant and his words matched his actions. He was straight honest. Maybe he didn't like her family either. 
That could have been why he walked out the way he did. Her heart skipped a beat as she wondered if that was why he had left. She let out a short laugh. That would mean that both she and Benjamin had left their house to get away from their guests. Sitting on the stairs, she let out a heavy sigh. Life had never been this complicated. Thinking back to her father, she wondered if he had ever felt this way, or her grandmother, Ruth. Her mother had passed away over 20 years ago, leaving them missing an important piece of their family. It was yet another moment where Beverly wished she had her mother to talk to, asking about marriage and men and family. Ruth was too cynical to care, and her father was too hesitant to be honest. She'd been five years old when her mother passed. Trissa had been too young to have any memories, still a squalling baby with tufts of dark hair everywhere. Beatrice Stutton had been a beautiful woman with dark, flowing hair and big blue eyes. She had a sweet voice that always sounded like it was singing. She had smelled like vanilla. She had liked to dance and swish her hips. What are you doing out here? Glancing up, Beverly found her husband with his hands on his hips. His hat hung low over his face, but she could still see his eyes. They were soft green. I could ask you the same thing, she pointed out. He climbed up the steps before putting his hand out to help her up. It's getting cold and the wolves will be coming out. Let's get inside. She couldn't suppress an eye roll. Oh, now you want to go inside. As if you have been feeding the horses all this time? I'm surprised you're not already friends with all the wolves. What is that supposed to mean? He let go when she was on her feet. Walking to the door, he opened it and glanced at her. I was busy. There was work to do and animals to feed, like the cows. Stepping through the doorway, Beverly groaned at his irritable tone. It was the horses. You said it was the horses earlier. I didn't mean anything by it, all right? Then why are you talking about wolves? He asked her, as though he had already forgotten he had mentioned them as well. Both of them grumbled on their way back to the kitchen, arguing about what they said and what they meant. As they reached the kitchen, Beverly frowned to find Sergio and Trissa still at the crowded table. Hardly any of the food was eaten after she'd put so much effort into it. Forget the wolves, Benjamin. I'm just saying that you could have waited until after supper for any more feedings or haying. Then why didn't you just say that? He frowned as she picked up his plate. What are you doing with that? I wasn't finished. She gave him a hard glare as she waved his plate before him. I tried to feed you, and this is how you repay me. You eat when it's supper time. I pick the supper time, not you. When he reached for the plate, she stepped back. Her hip ran into the table as she stretched away from her husband, but the man had long arms that reached around her, snatching the bread off the plate. Trissa giggled beside them. Covering her mouth politely with her hand, she beamed. Aren't you too quaint, bickering like you've been married for years? That's darling, Beverly, darling. Wouldn't you say, Sergio? Already Beverly had forgotten they had an audience. She hadn't been thinking. Once again, her impulsive nature had gotten her tangled up and distracted. Her eyes hardly glanced at Benjamin as they slid from Teresa to Sergio. She could feel her heart skip a beat, wondering what the man thought. Indeed. Twiddling his mustache, the man caught her gaze and smirked. The room suddenly felt much too warm. Heat spread up to her cheeks so quickly that she hardly knew what had happened. Beverly blinked, trying once again to pull herself together. She didn't want to blush in front of Sergio, but she couldn't make it stop. And Trissa wouldn't understand. No one would understand. As her chest tightened, Beverly attempted to swallow, but her throat was too dry. I'll tend the kitchen, she choked out. Everyone should visit the parlor. I will prepare some tea. Benjamin, show them the parlor, would you? He swallowed the bread, though she could feel him eyeing the plate. If I can just... She pushed his plate into his hands to make him move. Now please, she added tersely. Benjamin's dark eyes met hers. He searched her face before his eyes slid away. She saw his brow furrow, but he said nothing as he set the plate down and nodded. This way... He gestured politely to their guests and led the way out. It was only once they had all left the room that Beverly was able to take a deep breath. Her head was spinning, and she felt like she was falling apart on the inside and the outside. 
Her nerves were already feeling weak. If everything continued this way, she worried she wouldn't last the week. Chapter 8 Benjamin milked the cows early the next morning, his legs itching to stretch. He returned to the house to find Beverly moving around the chicken coop. Curious to see if she had learned her lesson, he set his buckets down on the porch to watch her. His eyes trailed over her pretty figure as she bustled about. When the hens stepped close, she nudged them politely away with her skirts. Seemed like she was always moving those hips of hers to make the skirts twirl. Yes, I see you, Beverly announced in the fresh morning air. Henriette, you move yourself and I'll give you some extra feed. Now don't give me that look. We talked about this yesterday, remember? We made a deal. Apparently, she had named the chickens as well as the horses. His lips quirked up as she gave the chickens attitude. No matter how much they argued, he tried his best not to let it go to his head. There was always a new day, after all, with new opportunities, although he hadn't expected this to be one of them. Don't you laugh at me, Beverly said, as she headed up the lane to the house after noticing him there. I wasn't going to, he replied mildly. Once she reached him, he opened the back door for her and picked up his buckets. Good morning, Beverly. She paused, her face pink, as she glanced up with an unreadable gaze before stepping through the door. Good morning, Benjamin. I was thinking about making a quiche. It would take longer, but it would be delicious. When she glanced over at him, he nodded. Quiche sounds good, he replied, not sure why she was asking for his point of view. All he cared was that there was food on the table. After eating his own biscuits and jerky for most of his life, he was eager for anything else. So far, Beverly's cooking skills had yet to disappoint. The young woman set the eggs on the table and counted them carefully after nodding to him. Her eyes focused on the task before her, hands fumbling through the eggs. She looked more determined than usual, that stubborn chin set tight against her jaw. After Benjamin set the buckets down, he studied her for a minute as he wondered what was going on in her mind. She could irritate him to no end, but he dealt with more complicated people, like his neighbors. Remembering his last conversation with Herkins, he realized he needed to reach out to Briskin. The man had allowed over a dozen of his cattle to cross property lines, this hadn't happened for a while, but they'd already talked about the importance of keeping their ranches separate, especially if Briskin was trying to slowly make his way to Herkins. It wasn't Benjamin's business, of course, but his own ranch was his business, and he aimed to keep things straight between his dealings with the men. The idea of talking to Briskin didn't thrill him. What's wrong, Benjamin? He blinked to find Beverly cocking her head up from across the table, her brow crinkled in concern. There was a soft frown on her lips as she leaned forward. She didn't know about the feud. Benjamin had forgotten to inform her, but he didn't want to get her involved. Benjamin shook his head. It's nothing I should see to the horses. There's some business I have to take care of, and I'd rather handle it sooner rather than later. As he headed back toward the door, he could hear her pattering steps following him. Already? It's so early. Well, you'll return for the quiche, won't you? Benjamin, you're too thin. I need you eating, and I don't trust you to remember on your own. Come home soon, won't you? Raising an arm behind him, he gave a short wave. I'm sure I will. She was a strange woman. First she would argue with him, then she'd talk nonsense to animals, and then try to be kind to him. Beverly was a good cook and a pretty woman, but that's all he understood about his wife. Everything else confused him. But there were other things to worry about. Benjamin saddled and mounted his horse to head toward the Briskin property line. He stepped off his path only to round up the cattle, nudging them in the right direction back toward their home. Though the day was young, the warm sun began to heat up as a reminder that they were in early summer. Colorado had mild heat streaks, but this was going to be a hot day. Sweat trickled down his brow as he led his horse around the cattle that didn't belong to him. Never still, they went back and forth as he guided the horns off his property. Someone's up early! Benjamin glanced up, only to bring your cattle home. They were on my property, again. The old man squinted at him from below the brim of his black hat. 
He had long gray hair that looked like a scraggly bush sitting on his shoulders with a beard to match. Chewing on tobacco, he leaned forward in the saddle to smile. It looked more like a sneer. My oh my, Briskin rattled in his raspy voice. What a silly mistake. I certainly hope that is all it was. Benjamin set his shoulders back to sit up straight. Looking the man in the eye, he added, I already talked to you about this and you said you would be more careful. This can't keep happening, Briskin. Chuckling, Briskin shrugged like it was no matter. I can't keep track of every cow of mine now, can I? They stood in a clearing only half a mile into Briskin's property. Looking around, Benjamin thought the place looked more like a swamp than a field. There was a thick grove of trees nearby with branches dancing. But there wasn't a breeze. He watched from the corner of his eye, knowing he had to tread carefully. Can't you? Benjamin set his lips in a hard line. You have four cow hands. I can see them in the trees. So long as you and Herkins are fighting, neither of you gets to touch my land. That made the man twitch. Briskin's lips curled in disgust. Don't you say that name here? If you knew any better, you'd be more careful about where you go. I came here as a courtesy, Benjamin reminded him, making sure he kept his voice soft. But he could feel something tickling the back of his neck. He used one hand to slowly and silently unlock the tether that held his gun in its holster. I'm not here for trouble, Briskin. You know I don't like that. Briskin spat on the ground. For all I know, you're spying for the old coot now. I've had my cows on your property, and you never paid no mine before. If you're not helping us, then you're as bad as the enemy. His gut tightened as though warning him to get out of there. That was all Benjamin wanted. He could feel the tension growing between them. Swallowing hard, he thought quickly. This wouldn't be the first time he was in a tricky situation. It only annoyed him because he had no reason to be. I'm just your neighbor, Benjamin reminded him in his calmest voice. He took his hand off his holster and saddle to raise them both in the air. And Herkin's neighbor. I only came to ask you to tend your cattle on your land. I just want to manage my ranch without trouble. What you and Herkins do is none of my business. I'm going to head home now. If you need my help for anything else as a neighbor, let me know. He paused a moment to let the words sink in. Slowly dropping his arms, he glanced towards the trees to find that they were still. I'm going to leave now, Benjamin said again, louder this time. Have a good day. Best of luck for a good harvest. As he turned away, Briskin muttered something under his breath before raising his voice to say, We'll see. You watch your back, young man. I do, Benjamin tipped his hat before nudging his horse along. The animal moved quietly as they left the clearing. Immediately, they made their way into the nearby grove with low branches and crowded bushes to shield them. He took the long way back to the house. Though the tension left his stomach as they increased the distance from the Briskin property, Benjamin could still feel a tightness in his shoulders that made him wonder just how much more careful he needed to be, and for how long, forever. Briskin had always been a crazy old coot from what he knew of his neighbor. The man was prone to paranoia with his grim demeanor and hard drinking ways, but he had never crossed a line he couldn't step back across. All the stories pointed out his strange moods, but he had never attacked. It made Benjamin wonder if he was taking enough precautions. He backtracked through his thoughts on the long ride. He moved his cattle further north beyond the river before heading home. That hadn't been enough time to make all the decisions he had been thinking about, but it was a start. He'd add some more fencing around his property to make it harder for the wrong cattle to make it onto his land and teach Beverly to shoot better. She could learn to shoot while riding, shoot under fire, and how to use a shotgun, just to make sure she would be fine. With her still on his mind, he stepped into the house. The day was nearly gone. He was covered in dust and dirt, weary from the hard labor and pressures on his mind. All Benjamin wanted to do was cool down with some of his wife's sweet lemonade and have a quiet evening. As he took off his hat, he was just opening his mouth to ask her to make him a drink when he found her sitting at the table with Sergio. It was just the two of them sitting on either side of a corner, elbows touching as they talked quietly.
He would have thought nothing of it if Beverly hadn't started upon his arrival. She jumped to attention, dropping her arms as her eyes opened wide, almost as if she were guilty. Benjamin closed his mouth as he fiddled with his hat. He had forgotten about their guests. He had forgotten how much the other gentlemen annoyed him. And he had forgotten the way his wife looked at the other man. Any relief or goodwill he had felt for her dissipated in an instant. His jaw tightened as he narrowed his eyes between the two parties. Sergio masked his thoughts with a formal smile. There you are, Benjamin. We were wondering when we would see you again. Haven't seen you since yesterday. There's work to do, Benjamin cut the words off his tongue. Something bitter rose up his spine. He didn't know what it was, but it made his blood pump, irritating him. This here's a ranch, isn't it? What he means, Beverly interceded quickly as she smiled and rushed around the room, is just that we were getting worried about you. He scoffed, setting his hat down. Didn't look like you had even noticed. The young woman flushed bright red, freezing by the sink. She opened her mouth and closed it as he stalked out of the room. It wasn't often he made her speechless, but he couldn't bring himself to enjoy the moment. Benjamin grumbled as he went to his room to wash up. Any hope he'd had for a pleasant evening had flown right out the window. Chapter 9 After Benjamin left the room, Beverly wondered what had just happened. She glanced at Sergio, who just shrugged at her. What is wrong with him, I wonder, the man said aloud. Turning back to the counter, she tried to think. Benjamin had been fine earlier, except now he had a mood. First, she supposed it was his workout on the ranch, but he'd acted that way the night before around their guests, like Sergio. Her face flushed. He works hard, Beverly answered over her shoulder without bothering to look at him. I'm sure he's all right. She didn't love Sergio anymore. Those feelings were gone. They had been tossed into the trash after discovering what he had done with Teresa. Though she still felt bitterness, she didn't feel love except it was easier to think whenever she wasn't with him. Though her cheeks would flush at the memory of the way she had once adored him, all she felt now in her heart was bitterness. As she grabbed a bowl and eggs, her hands shook. She wiped her brow and tried to focus. After all, she was married, married to Benjamin, mostly happily as well. It was hard sometimes, but what they had was good and functional. They took care of their duties and could occasionally enjoy each other's presence. Sometimes. She licked her lips and tried to focus. There was supper to prepare and chores to manage. Just as she was about to ask Sergio to leave so she could work, Trissa came into the room and suggested she take a walk with her husband. The two of them wandered off. Though she could see them from outside her kitchen window, Beverly shook her head and focused on her work. Tension flooded her system, and it was only through humming and preparing supper that she was able to distract herself. After a quiet supper, Beverly announced she would retire early that evening. She cleaned up and went to bed. Benjamin joined her after his work was done. Neither of them was tired, but they lay side by side for hours until she eventually drifted off. The next morning, she woke the moment Benjamin sat up. She swallowed and spoke up to say what was on her mind before she lost her courage. I'm sorry. He paused from putting his shoes on. Sitting up, Beverly cleared her throat. She held the blankets up to her chest. I'm not sure why, but I feel the need to apologize. I'm sorry for whatever I did. Benjamin glanced over his shoulder. You're apologizing for something without knowing why. That doesn't make any sense. She frowned. Heard he wasn't accepting it nor grateful. I'm trying to be nice, Benjamin. You've been in such a bad mood, I realized I must have done something. Can't you just accept my apology? The man stood to button his shirt. As he turned to look at her, a blush crept up her face. She realized then that she'd never seen the man shirtless. Dropping her eyes, she fiddled with the blanket. All right, Benjamin said a moment later. I have work to do. The door creaked open and then shut. When she glanced up, he was gone. Beverly's eyes widened incredulously as she wondered if that had been him accepting the apology or ignoring her. She threw her hands up in exasperation. Though she fell back into her pillows, she couldn't fall back asleep. Soon she decided to dress and prepare some porridge for everyone. 
Her sister and former fiancé came down from the loft in a particularly cheerful mood. They held hands on top of the table and giggled as though they had some grand secret. It made her uncomfortable. Unsettled, Beverly tried to think of something to do. She could always run away or hide for a few hours. But then she reminded herself that this was her home and she shouldn't have to hide. Whatever shall we do today? Trissa glanced over with a broad smile. Shopping, perhaps? Beverly blinked. They came to visit her, and now Trissa wanted to go shopping. For a second, she wanted to tell her sister that it was ridiculous until she recalled, that's what they liked to do once upon a time back in Virginia. No, Beverly said, as she wondered if her sister had noted how few shops there were in town. Hadn't she already told them that Colorado wasn't a place of frivolous means? Even just looking at the difference between their dresses was apparent. She didn't know when it had happened, but her dresses had grown simpler. There was still a hint of lace and an occasional ribbon. But she didn't wear the piles of petticoats and underskirts like she once had. She had given it perhaps two days before tossing them aside. No? Sergio raised his eyebrows. Wouldn't you like to decorate your home more? Frowning, she glanced around. More? It doesn't need... She inhaled sharply, reminding herself to be kind. Beverly thought fast, scrunching her nose before opening her eyes wide. I know, a picnic. Let's go on a picnic. That brightened her mood. She enjoyed a good picnic. Benjamin had yet to agree to join her for one, though she often took her meals outside if she were alone. And if she had to spend time with these two, then it would be nice if she didn't feel so confined within her home. Beverly let the two wander off as she handled the kitchen. They hadn't offered to help, nor did she want to ask them. It was her home, after all. Those two would probably only mess up. It took her a few hours to straighten everything up, but she was able to prepare a basket and grabbed her straw hat before calling for Teresa and Sergio. Her sister popped her head out from the parlor to laugh. What is that on your head? A hay bale? That's not nice to say, Sergio came into the hall. He gave her a smile and a wink. Better than a cheat, Beverly muttered under her breath, scowling as she headed for the door. Are you two accompanying me or not? I know just the spot. Trissa trailed after her, giggling. You look silly, sister. Where is your bonnet? I'm only curious. It's like you've turned into a sweet little milkmaid out in the middle of nowhere. Where are you leading us, my little milkmaid? Straight into the river, Beverly muttered under her breath. Then she plastered a smile on her face as she turned around. Come along now, children. That always made her sister groan. Trissa hated being called a child. Don't call me that. Faster, Beverly sang, her mood brightening as she led the way down the trail. Already the sunny day was brightening her mood. Forgetting the party behind her, she twirled and hummed as she carried the basket with both hands. A soft breeze blew by, ruffling her hair. It was enough to cheer her up that she was still smiling as she prepared the picnic. Setting aside her irritation, Beverly tried to enjoy the afternoon. She didn't like being annoyed. The sun was shining, she had prepared a picnic, and she had family beside her. There was no reason to be upset. Though she had to tell herself this a few times, she was determined to have a perfectly good afternoon. Oh, look at that! Trissa took her husband's hand and led him to the water. Look at this. Isn't it quaint? The two of them began to talk quietly. It was one of the spots that Benjamin had pointed out to her upon her arrival there. Beverly glanced up, telling herself that she was glad they could see the beauty of her home, too. Behind them sat her house on the ridge, tall and mighty and cheerful. Then nearby sat the stream, coming from the mountains in the distance and leading into the valley where it split into three rivers. It was as wild as it was beautiful. She leaned forward to fix a corner of the blanket when movement caught her eye. It was skinny and long. The first thought was that of a snake. Beverly gasped in panic, leaning back. You should be careful out here. This time she gasped at the strange voice. Jerking back, Beverly found an old man on a black horse. The man wore a black hat and scraggly facial hair. His frown looked as though it were trapped on his face. Who are you? She asked as she climbed to her feet. What? You don't live here. Footsteps followed behind her. 
Still bewildered at the strange man, she glanced back to see Sergio and Trissa coming over. Her heart hammered as she glanced back to the horse and the man. I don't live here, the old man agreed as he chewed tobacco. She frowned, studying him carefully. His eyes were dark as they glared at her. Then what are you doing here, she asked him in exasperation. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Why? We're only neighbors. Thought I had best... Introduce myself, the man said slowly. He tipped his hat and stared into her soul. As he shifted, she noticed the polished pistol strapped to his side. Suppressing a shudder, Beverly straightened up. She had to rein in the impulse to say anything rude, though she wasn't sure she decided against it. There was something that she didn't trust about him. I'm Mrs. Witten, she announced firmly. My sister and her husband, Mr. and Mrs. Margia. And you are? He tutted before saying, Scott Briskin at your service. Thank you. Beverly cut him off before he could add anything. Her heart pounded loudly in her chest. But we don't need your service. If you have anything you'd like to say, you may return when my husband is with us. Until then, I'd like to invite you to leave our property. Our property, he repeated just as Trissa gasped. That's awfully rude, her sister murmured. Beverly, he's your neighbor. Good day, Mr. Briskin. Beverly stuck her chin out, ignoring Trissa. She forced a smile as she narrowed her eyes at the strange man. Don't worry, Scott Briskin spat a wad of tobacco out before offering a grim smile. Your husband knows I'm here. I'll be off then. The man nudged his horse to turn, and they headed off at a quick trot. His gray hair flowed around his shoulders that hunched over his saddle. He rode before disappearing into the grove of trees. Beverly frowned, trying to remember where that direction led. Was it further onto the property? Was it towards his own home? Her fingers danced across her skirts as she tried to figure out what had just happened. That was rude, wasn't it? She turned to Teresa and Sergio. He was rather... No. Trissa shook her head as she put her hands on her hips. I meant you. Beverly, look at this place. There's nothing out here. With so few people, you can't be rude to your neighbors. He said he had your husband's permission, didn't he? She blinked. Then she glanced back to where Briskin had gone. But he was... You saw him, didn't you? Sergio glanced between the two women and shrugged. He was strange, but he was just an old man. Have you not met your neighbors? Though irritated, a sliver of doubt slipped right into her mind as she wondered if the two of them could be right. Everyone had a gun, after all. It was the West, and not all of his property. Well, their property was fenced up to keep people out. She stood there, swishing her hips as she thought about it. She did have a tendency to be impulsive. Maybe he hadn't been as strange as she supposed. Beverly hesitated not certain of what to do next. She stood there, trying to make up her mind. What smells so good? Trissa sat down on the blanket, already distracted. I'm starving. You just ate, Beverly muttered under her breath. Brushing off the tension, she sat back down and set out the food. She'd been happy just a moment ago. Had she not? There was no need for people, let alone men she hardly knew, to ruin her day. Beverly shook her head and told herself to worry later. There was a picnic to enjoy that she had worked hard on. Determined to enjoy herself, Beverly brushed her hair back and pulled out a slice of cheese to enjoy. Chapter 10 Two more calves were born. It meant good business, and Benjamin enjoyed helping the new mothers. Animals understood life in a way that humans did not and trusted their instincts. Their way of life was beautiful and simple. He counted them lucky. Being a human was complicated. There was only so much he could clean off in the fields, however, so he headed home early. He settled his horse in the open near the barn. He noticed Chief wasn't around and wondered if Beverly had gone for a ride. Hopefully she had kept in mind everything he had taught her so far. Walking over to the water trough, Benjamin rolled up his sleeves and started to wash up. He looked around as he wondered what she was doing. Was Beverly riding? Did she enjoy horse riding as much as she claimed? She had to. The smile she wore every time she climbed onto that horse was more than evident. His eyes skirted to the empty house before noticing movement down the trail. 
Around the garden came Beverly on a dark horse. She wasn't alone. From the looks of it, she was accompanied by Sergio. The man followed after her, riding chief. Benjamin straightened up with a frown. He didn't like the idea of a stranger on one of his horses. Besides, Chief was his wife's horse. What was Beverly doing letting someone else ride, especially this man? But he didn't have to worry for long. Before he could take another breath, he froze as Chief bucked. The city man fell right off. It wasn't the best view, but it was good enough. Benjamin chortled quietly to himself before concern for his horse overcame him. And Beverly, who was nearby, and his guests, he had to be concerned for them, too, as a host. Oh, my goodness, Beverly's sister shrieked as she popped out from the grove of trees. Benjamin hurried down the lane, grabbing his horse before Chief could go anywhere. Beverly stayed on the other horse, calling out concern. Sergio, what happened? Is Benjamin, is that you? Is Chief all right? Sergio, can you stand? My goodness. It was a heated commotion, especially with Trissa screeching her concern. But Sergio was quick to silence her, climbing to his feet and dusting off his jacket to show that he was bruised, but fine. I can't believe you would let your horses do that, Trissa scolded, though Benjamin wasn't certain who she was talking to. My husband could have been killed. Beverly slid off the horse. He wasn't. We can all thank God for that. Chief here is a bold fellow, that's all. He should be slaughtered, Trissa proclaimed. He won't be touched, Beverly said sharply. It silenced her sister and even surprised Benjamin with her vehemence. He held Chief's reins until his wife stepped forward to take them. She cleared her throat as he raised his eyebrow at her. She forced a smile before speaking up. It was an unfortunate accident, but Sergio said he was fine, did he not? Perhaps we should call it a day. It has been rather eventful. Then there was a gasp. Sir, what happened? Benjamin glanced up to see Trissa staring at his chest. Her eyes were wide open as she gaped in dismay. Looking down, he was reminded of the dried blood and other fluids on his shirt. It's only blood, he shrugged. He glanced at Beverly in time to see her lip twitch. Was another calf born? She asked politely. Two, he nodded. Then he glanced at the reins. I should take the horses back. They could use a break. Oh, it's all right, Beverly volunteered quickly. Why don't you take Sergio and Teresa back to the house and wash up? There was a merry tone to her words. He glanced at her curiously, wondering what was going on inside her head. Shifting his feet, he wondered what he didn't understand. What was it about Sergio that made her want to let him ride her favorite horse? And why was she still cheerful after his fall? Ben? He jerked his head up, trying to remember the last time someone had called him that. His eyes glanced over to Beverly. Right. He cleared his throat. The house. Yes, I'll wash up. His thoughts were churning even as he led his sister-in-law and brother-in-law up to the house where he washed up and changed his clothes. Though his wife called him out again at supper for being quiet, Benjamin simply didn't have anything to say. Not yet, anyway. Oh, I saw our neighbor, she added, while passing him the butter. It was said so casually that he didn't pay any mind, until he had the butter in his hands and realized what she had said. Neighbor? His muscles tensed. Who was that? She waved a flippant hand. Scott Briskin, he said his name was. Wasn't a very friendly sort of man, but I suppose he was harmless. Putting the butter down, Benjamin found he was no longer hungry. Briskin had come onto his property to talk to his wife. Was that a threat or an attempt to make peace? Though he wanted to be hopeful, he knew it best to be careful. What did he say? He forced through his clenched jaw. Her eyes flickered up and squinted. That he was looking for you. Already his mind was working hundreds of miles an hour. Fiddling with his knife, he nodded slowly. He studied Beverly as he said, Perhaps it's time you learn to use that shotgun. She glanced up with those beautiful dark eyelashes of hers fluttering softly. A few times in the past, she had done so to tease him in one of their arguments. But this one was natural. He wasn't certain how he could tell. However, there was something about the trust in her gaze as she gave him a nod. I think that sounds lovely, she replied agreeably, leaning forward to him from across the table. There was a strand of hair hanging to the side of her cheek that he had the sudden urge to tuck behind her ear. We can do that tomorrow. 
Sergio, Teresa, would you like to join us? He had forgotten they weren't alone. Benjamin straightened up, still gripping his knife. The others were in agreement. Though they continued the conversation, he had nothing more to say. There was too much on his mind. The rest of the evening passed as the other three people at the table talked about their childhood. Beverly and Trissa had known Sergio for years. There were several inside jokes, and Beverly had certainly had some fun with each of them, especially Sergio. Eventually, Benjamin retired early, his hands balled up into frustrated fists. His thoughts were so tied up that he hardly slept a wink. When Big Red the rooster crowed the next morning, Benjamin blinked. Part of him wondered if he had even fallen asleep. Slowly but surely, the day passed. He tended to the cows and worked on the ranch. He knew he needed to hire some help, but hadn't got around to trying very hard. Not when he was busy tending to his cattle. I've invited them along, Beverly announced when she met him on the trail. The sunlight set a golden halo around her head that made him take a second look. Then he noticed Sergio and Trissa walking up, and his already exhausted mood took another step in the wrong direction. Benjamin shifted his weight uncomfortably before glancing away in annoyance. They were everywhere lately. He wondered how long they were staying. They were in the far grove beyond the garden where he was setting up fresh targets of bundled sticks and cloth hanging from branches. He nodded before finishing his task and went over to join the party. Beverly was talking to Sergio about the gun resting against the fallen tree trunk. She waved her hands around more so than usual. They stood only inches apart as the man's wife, Beverly's sister, picked flowers nearby. Hey, Benjamin cut through the conversation. Are you ready or not? Looking over in surprise, Beverly nodded. She glanced at Sergio and then took a step back. Of course I am, Benjamin. That's why I am here, aren't I? I was waiting for you. Sergio grinned, only fueling Benjamin's irritation. He pursed his lips and picked up the gun. Then let's get started. Turning his back to the man, he started instructing his wife on how to use a shotgun and how it was different from a rifle. Slow down, Beverly scolded him. You're talking too fast. Then pay attention, he furrowed his brow. This could mean life or death. Whoa, Sergio spoke up. There's no need to concern the ladies like that. Snapping his head around, Benjamin wondered if the man had ever shot at a living target, if he even knew what that was like. Had the man ever been afraid for his life? He looked too soft to understand fear and his survival instinct. Thank you, but I'm giving the lesson, Benjamin reminded him sourly. He tried to continue teaching his wife, but his impatience grew as Beverly asked questions and did everything wrong. Though he attempted to nudge her shoulder and hands to do it right, she ignored his corrections and bruised her shoulder. If you had done it right, Benjamin gritted his teeth in frustration, then you wouldn't have hurt yourself. Beverly gave him a look. You know what? I think this lesson is over. Fine. Fine. The rest of his day was quiet as well. Benjamin spent it out in the fields on his horse, muttering angrily. He could hardly believe what was going on under his own roof. The way Beverly looked at that other man burned in a way that no fire had ever burned. It was obvious from how she talked to him and looked at him that she once adored him. That frustrated Benjamin as he wondered if keeping his marriage was worth this trouble. He could just send her to go back home with Trissa and Sergio when they left. As the night set in, he found himself dozing asleep in bed even as he lay next to his wife, who he knew had to be thinking of another man. Benjamin tossed and turned until suddenly his wife was shaking him awake. Benjamin, she hissed in the dark as he groggily turned over, confused as to why everything was so dark and why she was touching him. Ben, there's something out there. Rubbing his eyes, he sat up. The irritation from earlier lingered as he wished he were still asleep. He listened as his wife glanced around. Are you sure? He sighed. It's probably just a fox. It's bigger than that, she pouted. Her eyes trailed over him before clumsily getting out of bed. I'm going to see what it is. That got him on his feet. No. Suddenly alert, Benjamin had his boots on before grabbing the nearby rifle. He loaded it up and gestured to her as he went to the door. Stay put. He reached the back door, filing out quietly. His heart hammered loudly in his ears, every nerve alert. 
Benjamin forced himself to focus, setting aside his earlier feelings. The moon was only half full and waning. Moving slowly, his eyes searched for any movement. Soon the porch was cleared, and he made his way down the steps. I think it was north. Swearing under his breath, he glanced back to find Beverly in her coat and boots as she followed after him. She gestured lightly as he saw a silver glint in her other hand. He took a deep breath as he followed her movements and started to look around. What's going on out here? Benjamin gritted his teeth as he heard Beverly turn to talk to her sister. Hush, nothing is happening. It's fine. Here, I'll lead you back inside. Everything is fine. Let's go back to bed. Soon he was on his own, checking around the nearby trails. After a few more minutes, Benjamin decided to turn back to the house. His wife had probably heard a fox or an owl. He was rounding the corner when something broke under the heel of his shoe. Benjamin stiffened before crouching down to find pieces of a broken lantern. A chilled sensation ran down his spine. His grip tightened on the gun, but he found nothing else and no one around. He reluctantly returned inside, his thoughts a mess. Chapter 11 Beverly returned to bed after settling Teresa back down, but she couldn't fall back asleep. She lay there, clutching the blankets, even after Benjamin returned and joined her. Did you find anything? Anyone? She whispered hesitantly. He grunted. Go to sleep, Bev. She swallowed before frowning. He had never called her that before. No one had ever called her that. Though she wondered what it meant, she was more concerned by what else he had said. And that was nothing. What does that mean? She hissed quietly. You didn't find anything? I said go back to sleep. His tone didn't leave any room for an argument. There was movement and a thump as he punched his pillow twice before settling back down. She lay stiff beside him. It was still so dark. Even as her eyes adjusted to the lack of light, she couldn't see the corners of the room. Her heart clenched tightly as she listened to Benjamin's huffy breathing. That meant he was irritated and restless. Perhaps he was mad that she had woken him. But she was so certain she had heard something. Though she couldn't explain what it was, something had been out there. Beverly shuddered as she convinced herself that she was safe. If Benjamin wasn't mad about that, then he was clearly mad over something else that she must have done. She could feel her soul sinking into despair. She had given up the man she wanted to marry so that her sister's reputation could be salvaged. But her sister didn't care, and her frustration was only growing worse. She just wanted to be done with everything. Beverly lay still until she spotted the first rays of light. By that point, Benjamin was breathing deeply and fast asleep. She ran her fingers through her hair, put on the nearest dress, and stepped out. The fresh air helped as she walked outside. She hoped it would clear her thoughts. Hands on her hips, she glanced around the porch as she considered taking a walk before preparing the morning meal. Her heart skipped a beat, wondering what she might find in the daylight. Though she walked around the house, there was nothing out of the ordinary to find. Just as she considered returning inside, she spotted the milk pails. The cows would need to be milked soon. Recalling how irritated her husband had been at her the night before after she had woken him up, she decided to try and be kind by tending to one of his tasks. Beverly grabbed the pails and headed down to the barn. It was tricky work, but Benjamin had taught her well. Though the chore took longer than expected, soon the pails were full. She felt proud seeing the warm milk before her and picked them up to take up to the house. What are you doing? She gasped dropping the pails. Milk splattered everywhere. Realizing her mistake, Beverly stumbled down and fumbled to rescue the hard-earned milk, but between the two pails, only one was still a quarter full. Her hard work spilled all around her. A heavy feeling settled over her chest. Exhausted after a sleepless night, she felt the urge to cry. Benjamin sighed, moving forward to grab the pails. He didn't say anything as he took the pails up to the house. Beverly felt her head pound as she tried to think of something she could have said. Something she could have done better. She wondered if she should have apologized. Her legs beneath her grew numb, so it took her a minute to stand. The day did not improve. Even after she managed to pull herself up and out of the barn, retrieving the eggs from the chicken coop proved as difficult. Henriette was in a mood and wouldn't stop pecking her. 
Beverly lost half the eggs before escaping to the house. Everything was ruined, especially their meals. It was only Trissa who was willing to say anything. You really should do better, Trissa added at the end of her lecture. Beverly hadn't heard most of it. She couldn't stand to hear her little sister tell her what to do, not in her own home, not after all that she had done. Thank you, she muttered before scowling. Would you like to prepare supper? Her sister's eyes widened. What? Goodness, no. That's not how you treat a guest in your home, Beverly. Even if we are family. Then I'm not quite certain it's the place of a guest to criticize their host, Beverly snapped in return. She stood up forcefully for effect. Her chair toppled over. It tugged on the corner of her skirt, ripping the hem. She groaned, muttering under her breath as she bent over to pick up the furniture. Trissa stood up. That is just rude! Isn't it, though? Beverly glanced up bitterly, wondering if her sister was finally connecting the dots. I won't be treated like this! Trissa huffed. She glanced between Beverly and Sergio. Sergio, aren't you going to stand up for me? At that, Beverly dropped the chair, no longer able to care. Not about her sister, not about Sergio, not about anything. She was sick and tired of everything, and she hated that she smelled like milk. Leaving the couple to argue, she headed to her bedroom to change. A clean dress might help her mood, and some quiet time. Beverly pulled out a dress and then brushed her hair. Only then did she feel better. Fixing her dress, Beverly took a deep breath. She was tired of being upset about things she couldn't control. No matter how mad and angry she was, she had to be stronger. She opened her bedroom door, believing herself ready to face the day again. Sergio was waiting. Beverly stopped, staring at him. Knots upon knots formed in her stomach. She held the door frame tightly, helping her to stand or stop herself from hitting him. She wasn't certain. Beverly, he said with a smile that made her heart skip a beat. There you are. Of course I am. She cleared her throat, thinking quickly of how to avoid him. Where else would I be? Where's Trissa? The man hurried after her at her heels, breathing down her neck. She's up in the loft, packing. She won't hear us down here. Where are you going? When she stopped in the kitchen, it was so sudden that he ran into her. Their bodies collided only for a moment before she skipped forward so they wouldn't touch. It made her body tingle in ways that she now despised. Beverly shuddered before turning around to face him with a frown as she realized what he had just said. Why does it matter if she hears us or not, she hissed. We have nothing to talk about. His fingers twisted the ends of his mustache. Don't you miss me? Beverly decided to move even further away. What are you talking about? She walked backwards to the back door as he trailed after. I miss you. The door banged shut behind him. Beverly whirled around in astonishment. Though he stood in the shadows, she could see his eyes. He meant it. He meant it just like when he had first asked for her hand all those years ago, and again when he had asked her to wait. Her heart pounded in her chest. She could feel her throat dry up as she mustered up her anger. There was so much weighing on her shoulders that she had tried so hard to set aside. Ever since she had seen a blushing Teresa and sheepish Sergio step out of the garden shed that morning, Beverly had struggled to let go of her pride and accept the inevitable. Excuse me? She forced through gritted teeth, wondering if he dared say what she thought he was saying. He took a step forward, his eyes soft. I mean it. I always loved you. It was always you. Our walks in the park, those whispers over dinners and all our letters. I can't stop thinking about them. An old, familiar, bitter taste seeped into her mouth. Though Sergio had hurried away that tragic morning, Trissa had stepped inside their home only to be confronted by her family. The girl had offered a sheepish grin but held her head high. Trissa had always adored Sergio. Beverly hadn't thought her sister capable of such a thing. She and Sergio had known how Trissa felt. It was a victory smile. Trissa had won. After all of Beverly's dedication and patience, she wouldn't marry Sergio. The family wouldn't stand for such shame. Though her father and Ruth had argued about their options, it had been Beverly who told them what had to happen. Trissa had to marry Sergio. And Sergio hadn't minded. He had been gracious, so she heard, in his acceptance of a different wife. 
she had refused to speak to him, ignoring him on his wedding day. Even though she had left that life behind, Sergio was back as though nothing had happened. Beverly didn't know whether she should cry or laugh. How dare you, she stammered. Stepping forward, he reached out his hands to her. There was a sparkle in his eyes as he said, We could run away. Just the two of us together again? We could do it. I'll leave my practice and we can start over again. I miss you, Beverly. I never really loved Trissa. There was a quiver in her heart, but now it felt different. As he spoke, Beverly realized what a fool she had been all along. The more she thought about it, the more Beverly realized that she had adored a man she never understood. Perhaps she'd once had a childish crush on the man, but now that was over. He didn't respect her or listen or care. If anyone did, it was Benjamin. He had listened to her nonsense, taught her useful skills, and gave her the space she wanted. Though they didn't always get along, he had treated her better than anyone else had for a long time. She would rather a lifetime of her silly arguments with Benjamin than see Sergio's face ever again. You're crazy, Beverly looked up at Sergio, feeling that she was finally seeing the world right. Beverly, listen to me, he demanded as he grabbed her arms. A sliver of fear passed over her as he gripped her elbows. She stiffened as she grew sick of Sergio. It broke the dam holding back the anger that she had tried to put away. Beverly shook him off, and she slapped Sergio as hard as she could. Chapter 12 The broken lantern consumed his thoughts. Benjamin knew it belonged to someone. Most likely one of his neighbors was snooping around, either on him or on the way to the other property. He could feel it in his gut that something was mounting between Briskin and Herkins. Something was going to happen soon. But what was it? He didn't want to know, but something told him that he needed to be alert. The hair on the back of his neck wouldn't stop irritating him, and his gut was tight with apprehension. He had to be careful. From the looks of it, Beverly was struggling as well. Greeting her in the barn wasn't supposed to have scared her, but he didn't know what to do besides try to help her out. He had taken the milk and gone on to do with it what he could. The best way he thought to support her was to let her pull herself together. That's what he had to do. On his own as a child, there was no one around to comfort him. When things went wrong, he forced himself to pick himself up, so he learned not to rely on people. Beverly was a strong woman, and she could take care of herself, both emotionally and now with her gun training. He thought of gifting her one and wondered what he would give her. Then he laughed. A rifle, of course. He set that onto a shelf in his mind to keep on hand for later. Perhaps when he returned to town and things were easier for them. There were simple days that the two of them had enjoyed with each other, where their arguments were more playful than annoying. Except he didn't have time to work on his marriage with her either, because of his neighbors. Who was it, he muttered, as he brushed down his horse. The animal snorted with a shake of his head, but otherwise had no other helpful response to share. Together they headed onto the range. Benjamin was hoping it would help him relax. His thoughts wouldn't stop moving about as the paranoia gripped his shoulders. He thought back to the conversations he'd had with his neighbors, and again about the lantern. It had sounded like a good idea to keep Beverly out of it. But then fear struck him to the bones that someone might try to hurt her. Benjamin immediately turned for home. He left his horse behind and headed up to the house. Rounding the corner, he spotted Beverly on the porch. She faced the house, her shoulders stiff. Benjamin was just about to call out when someone else spoke. I miss you. The door banged shut behind Sergio. It was his voice, though Benjamin couldn't see the man. He stopped short, and his muscles seized as his earlier concerns about his wife came back to mind. Excuse me. Beverly asked, still not noticing her husband. Benjamin hesitated, wanting to speak up, but he didn't know what he would say. It made him think back to Sylvia, that sweet young woman who had stolen his heart. But now he wasn't quite certain if her eyes were blue or green or brown. Had her smile been straight or crooked? She was part of a life he had let go of several years ago. His hands balled into fists at the thought of losing someone else. Frustration restrained him from moving, from even breathing. 
a hard knot formed in his stomach, as he wondered what it was about him that made everyone want to leave him behind. Sergio talked on eagerly. The man moved into the sunlight. I mean it. I always loved you. It was always you. Our walks in the park, those whispers over dinners and all our letters. I can't stop thinking about them. How dare you, Beverly shook her head. Don't, Sergio. We could run away. Just the two of us together again. We could do it. I'll leave my practice and we can start over again. I miss you, Beverly. I never really loved Trissa. Benjamin wondered what Beverly thought of that. She always spoke protectively of her family, even their imperfections. He had seen the struggle within her lately. You're crazy! Relief flooded through his body as he recognized the vehement emotion in his wife. She used that tone rarely, only in disgust or terror. He found his muscles relaxing. She didn't love Sergio. Beverly, listen to me, the other man ordered. Benjamin watched as Sergio laid hands on his wife. Again, his hands balled into fists, but this time he started moving. As he set foot on the steps, he spotted Beverly as she raised her arm and slapped Sergio Marguia with all her might. Though she didn't look it, she had plenty of strength. He had seen it when teaching her about knives. Sergio had clearly not expected it. He lost his balance with a grunt, stumbling back as he clutched his cheek. The man fumbled as Beverly ran down the stairs. She ran, never noticing Benjamin right there. He reached out to his wife too late. Soon she was down the trail, headed past the barn. He took a step toward her, his heart aching for his wife as he thought how he could fix this for her. She didn't deserve such trouble. Then he heard Sergio mutter under his breath. Though Benjamin didn't know what he would have said to Beverly, he did know what he could say to him. Get out, Benjamin demanded. You've overstayed your welcome. Get your wife and leave us. What? Sergio sputtered, one hand on his cheek. The man's hair was all over the place and his shirt was ruffled. The city man had never looked so bewildered and there was something about it that made Benjamin want to laugh. You people of this wild land, I can't believe your rudeness. When the man stepped up to him, Benjamin took his own step forward. All it did was serve as a reminder that he was taller and definitely the strongest. You heard me, Benjamin narrowed his eyes. I would appreciate it if both of you were removed from my property within the hour. Either you can do it or I can. Sergio glanced him up and down before realizing his mistake. He made the wise decision to step back, nod and head into the house. He passed his wife who stepped out, her mouth slightly open. Trissa watched Sergio go before stepping out. I'm sorry. She gulped loudly once her husband was out of the way. What? Benjamin asked her sharply. I'm sorry. Trissa wrung her hands as she joined him on the porch. We'll leave, of course. But I wanted to apologize. This is all my fault. Beverly, she... She was to marry Sergio this spring. He blinked, not comprehending. It gave her the chance to continue speaking. Benjamin found himself listening as the young woman confessed the love she had always borne for her sister's intended and the actions she had taken to claim him. Trissa and Sergio were wed like the younger sister wanted, but she soon realized her mistake. She explained that she had hoped by bringing Sergio and Beverly together again, Sergio would let go of his old love and move on. I'm just... I'm sorry, Trissa finished with a sigh. She always said I was foolish. I thought that this would help my marriage. Instead, I nearly ruined yours. She bit her lip and glanced out where Beverly had run off. At least, I think it helped Beverly. I see the way she looks at you. It's different from how she ever looked at Sergio or anyone. I'm sorry. Would you tell her that for me, please? He nodded stiffly, still trying to wrap his head around her story. Trissa left him on the porch where he paced. Benjamin sorted through his thoughts and feelings as Trissa and Sergio packed up. The two of them hissed to one another, but respectfully avoided Benjamin as they prepared the horses and wagon and then left. His heart was still hammering when he watched the dust settle down. He rubbed his hands together and then turned towards the barn. Beverly had run off over an hour ago. The sun was already beginning to set. Fortunately, he knew just where to find her. If you feed him any more apples, then he's going to grow too fat to ride. Beverly looked over her shoulder as she walked with Chief through the grove of trees. 
Her long hair drifted down her back in soft waves. Leaves crunched under his boots as he walked over to her. She blinked several times before glancing away. There was a furrow in her brow, and he could see her tight grip on the reins. He'll be fine, I'm sure. I'll start supper soon. I just... I just wanted some time outside. He shrugged as he stepped up on the other side of the horse. Chief snorted in greeting as he gave the animal a pat on the neck. Don't worry about it, Benjamin told his wife. She glanced over at him as he shrugged. I'm not hungry. But what about Teresa? He noticed how she didn't say Sergio's name. They're gone. He pulled an apple off a nearby branch as he offered it to Chief. Benjamin chanced a glance over at her to see the corner of her lips quirk up as he ignored his earlier suggestion. Then she frowned. Gone? Gone where? Shrugging, Benjamin grabbed another apple and, after rubbing it on his shirt, took a bite for himself. Back home. Decided they were tired of this hard life. What? I mean, did they have anything else to say? Beverly asked him hesitantly, each word very careful. She wanted to know what he knew. Not having known she had company earlier, she had to be wondering what had happened, but he didn't want to worry her. Your sister said she was sorry. About everything, she said. As for Sergio, he grunted. No one cares about Sergio. A snort escaped her lips. He grinned at having made her smile. When she looked up, Benjamin met her gaze and offered a nod with a shrug. She bit her lip but said nothing. Nothing more needed to be said. A comfortable peace settled between them. The two of them continued their walk around the grove. Beverly led the way with Chief, and Benjamin collected apples as they went. Though there were still words on his mind, he decided against saying anything. Part of him couldn't get the sound of that slap out of his mind. It made him chuckle every time. Chapter 13 Somehow, Benjamin knew. She could see the truth in those dark eyes. She didn't know how, she didn't know why, but he did. Though she had been terribly fearful of him learning about her past, a secret she had tried to forget about, now it didn't seem so terrible. So what if she had been jilted before the altar? It didn't matter. She was married and living in a beautiful wilderness, married to a reserved but honest man. He meant what he said. There was no sign of Sergio or Teresa when they returned home. It was quiet, peaceful, and the tension in her heart faded. They had eaten plenty of apples on their walk, heading straight to bed. She slipped under the blankets and was comforted by his presence. They didn't touch or say anything, but she could feel him close beside her. When she closed her eyes, she could hear his breathing. Her heartbeat fell into the same rhythm, and she drifted off to sleep with peace in her heart. All night, she dreamed of little moments that did not exist in her life. There were toys and blankets and cradles. Everywhere she looked, she would find Benjamin. He would smile at her and hold up a little boy. They had the same eyes. Beverly? With a small gasp, Beverly woke up. Benjamin was kneeling beside her, a hand on her arm. Their window was open with sunlight streaming through it. She stared in surprise. What time is it? Benjamin climbed off the bed and put out a hand to her. It's daytime, he offered. I let you sleep in. Hesitantly, she accepted his hand to climb to her feet. Still shy in her nightdress, she bit her lip. There was something different about Benjamin. It was charming and tender. He had just brushed his hair and looked cheerful. Why? she asked him suspiciously. Because you needed sleep, he offered vaguely before opening the door to her wardrobe. Get dressed. We're going on a picnic. A short laugh escaped her lips. A picnic? Is that what has you so excited? He stopped. No, Benjamin frowned, shifting uncomfortably. I'm not excited. That pout of his made her smile. Yes, you are. You're like a little boy on Christmas, Ben. What is it? His mouth opened only to close again. I just thought it was a nice day and we could do something nice. She cocked her head. Perhaps there was something about his suspiciously happy mood. But what about the ranch? There is work to do. We'll do it later, he reasoned. There's always time later. Beverly hesitated as she touched one of her dresses. The cows are milked? Have you gathered the eggs? He nodded hurriedly as his smile returned. It was a rather handsome smile. You're always trying to drag me along for a picnic, Beverly. 
Now that I've finally agreed, you should be thrilled. Her heart hammered. She thought back to the other day with Sergio. The man was gone, and she marveled over how free she felt. It was like there had been a heavy weight on her shoulders, and now it was gone. And yet, she was confused. Benjamin was passionate about his ranch, but she'd never seen him excited for anything, let alone a picnic. What about food? He placed his hands on his hips. We eat during the picnic, of course. There are apples and bread and cheese. What more do you need? Beverly opened her mouth and then closed it. She squinted at him, trying to understand what was on his mind, trying to decide what he was up to, but she couldn't figure it out. All right, she threw her hands up in exasperation. A picnic it is. When he grinned wider but didn't move, she raised her eyebrow. Would you like to watch me dress? His eyes widened. What? I, no, I'll step out. And he hastened out the door. A wicked grin spread across her face, even as she felt a hot blush reach her cheeks. She hadn't meant to be so playful. Just because there was a weight off her shoulders didn't mean she was free to be ridiculous. Beverly attempted to scold herself as she dressed and brushed her hair, folding it back into braids down her back. She put on her shoes, grabbed a shawl, and headed out. The horses were waiting, their saddlebags ready. Benjamin gave her a tip of the hat before helping her into the saddle. She thanked him for his help and gave Chief a nudge. Where are we off to? She asked her husband as he pointed them down the trail. It's a surprise, he announced to her. What? She couldn't resist dropping her mouth open. But, but that's preposterous. Do tell me. He shook his head with a grin. You'll see soon enough. I'm sure I've already seen it, she attempted to goad him. Come, Ben, just a clue. Can't you tell me something? Hmm, he pretended to think about it before winking. No, I don't think I shall. She felt a flutter in her heart. There was that charming grin of his. Though she supposed she saw it often, suddenly she couldn't have enough of it, of him. A warm hand wrapped around her waist to steady her on the ground as she climbed off Chief. Beverly looked up to find Benjamin. His eyes ran over her body before reaching her eyes. Is everything all right? It's perfect, she assured him before she could help herself. She had always been told she was too impulsive. Now Beverly couldn't help herself. She stalled, wishing he would never remove his arm from her. There was something about this moment with him that made her feel both vulnerable and strong. Chief snorted. Both she and Benjamin jumped apart. They caught each other's gaze and chuckled sheepishly. Benjamin gave her the blanket that she laid out while he pulled out their goods. Soon it was set up prettily right there on the small bluff he had shown her. The sight was a beautiful surprise, even better than her usual picnic spot. They sat beside a small stream with the mountains on the other side. There were trees all around, blocking her from seeing more than a few hundred yards in any direction. She felt like the rest of the world had disappeared. It was just them, him and her, Benjamin and Beverly. What do you think? He spoke louder than the cheerful river running along beside them. Beaming as he sat, Beverly couldn't help but scoot a little closer to him. Her heart thumped as she gave her husband a nod. He really was more handsome than Sergio. More handsome and more kind. Perfectly lovely, she assured him. Why, it feels like our own little Eden. He glanced around. Why, yes, it does feel like that. How about it? Our Eden. They shared a grin, their gazes holding one another before she had to blink. Pulling herself out of her daze, she wondered what was wrong with her. Perhaps it was too warm outside. She was certainly flushed. She helped herself to the water canteen and offered it to him before pulling out the food. Humming, she worked with Benjamin to organize the food and set it on their plates. They talked, laughing about everything and nothing. All their worries were stripped away, their guards dropping. For the first time in a long time, Beverly felt truly free. She felt happy to be alive, proud to be Benjamin's wife, and fortunate to live in such a beautiful world. Slowly the afternoon began to pass, the sun warming her heart. That's terrible, Beverly laughed, as Benjamin recounted the first time he had ridden a horse. Oh, you poor child, oh, she giggled as she tipped over the cheese platter. Bother, her husband chuckled. It's all right, here, let me. 
As he crawled onto his hands and knees, he suddenly froze. Beverly grabbed the cheese knife before noticing. She opened her mouth to ask what it was until she heard it herself. Hooves. Something was racing along, either horses or cattle or something of the type. Beverly craned her neck to look before climbing to her feet. Benjamin did the same, putting out a hand for her not to move. What do you think? Beverly started, but stopped when bullets rang out. The first one caught her by surprise. She shrieked, dropping the knife. The second followed so close that she wasn't certain it had happened. And then there was a third that made her jump again before arms wrapped around her, tugging her down. She grunted as the air in her lungs was knocked out. Beverly could hear her heart pounding in her ears, drowning out all other sound as she stared at Benjamin in shock as he lay on the ground beside her with his arms around her. When she opened her mouth again, there were more shots. Beverly flinched as her husband tightened his grip. We have to get out of here, he told her. Then he craned his neck around and nodded toward the horses. They were still tied to the branches, but they were done eating the grass, standing with their ears perked up. To the horses, he said. I'll keep you covered. He shifted, letting go to pull out his gun. Apprehension filled her as Beverly tried to find where the shooting had started. Give me a gun. I can help. What? No, he ordered. Now move. Stay on your hands and knees. I'll be right behind you. Though she wanted to argue, she forced herself to clamp her mouth shut and do as he commanded. They left their picnic and shuffled as guns echoed around them. They came from two different directions, though there were at least four guns being used. Just as they reached the horses, she glanced around. As she touched Benjamin's shoulder, he groaned. Her eyes widened as her hand came away with blood. Fear gripped her. You're hurt. She pulled at his shirt, but he stopped her. Ben, you're bleeding. I have to do something. We have to do something. I... You will, he nodded. You're going to get the sheriff. What do you mean, me? Beverly hissed. You're coming with me. He turned away to the saddle to grab his shotgun. Her eyes followed, spotting the weakness now in his shoulder. Dread gripped her so tightly that she thought she might bring up anything she had eaten moments ago. Get yourself to safety. Benjamin gave her a stern look. I'm not losing you. Before she could answer, a shot rang out and a tree branch only ten yards off broke loudly, clattering down. Immediately he moved, adjusting the loaded weapon to shoot in the direction where the bullet had come from. Grabbing the pistol, she did the same, but before she could shoot again, Benjamin nudged her barrel down. Go, he reminded her. Beverly didn't want to leave him, but there was a force behind his gaze that she couldn't ignore, and she couldn't get his earlier words out of her mind. He couldn't lose her. She didn't know what that meant. For a moment, she considered asking him. Then she clamped her mouth shut and, keeping the pistol in one hand, ran over to Chief to climb onto his back. Only then did she realize something. It's quiet. Benjamin glanced over as he realized the same thing. They waited, and she counted her breaths. The tension in the air was so thick that it hurt to breathe. One breath, two, three, four. He turned sharply, his hair falling in his face. The sheriff, Beverly... There wasn't a single part of Beverly Rose Stutton Witten that desired to leave him, but the strength in his eyes told her to go, and she obeyed. Chapter 14 Only when Beverly had disappeared did Benjamin turn back to the bluff they had deserted. His heart thumped loudly in his chest. He could smell the blood on his shirt, though it annoyed him more than it hurt. Adrenaline coursed through his body and kept him moving she would be safe. He told himself this over and over again as he forced himself to move forward. Silence had settled, though his nerves had not. He gripped his gun tightly as he kept his eyes and ears open. As he walked, Benjamin kept his head low and tried to think. There had been several shooters in a few directions. From what it appeared to be, they weren't even shooting at him and Beverly. At least that was what he hoped. If they were, then they were terrible shots. Benjamin continued his search, making his way through the trees and bushes. He moved quickly and efficiently. Most of the land was quiet except for the occasional rustling. There was nothing to see until he found the foot. The foot was attached to a leg that was attached to a body. Benjamin warily crept closer, nudging the foot with the butt of his gun. Then he noticed the bloody shirt where the man had been shot. 
It took a minute for him to recognize the body. Daniel Albert, Benjamin muttered. Albert was one of Herkin's most loyal ranch hands. Gritting his teeth, he realized what had happened. It was Herkin's and Briskin. They'd been shooting at each other, but only after crossing onto property that didn't belong to either of them. It belonged to Benjamin. He strapped the shotgun to his back to take the dead man's guns and then dragged Albert to the clearing. Then he looked for the rest of the men. The further along he walked, the more frustrated he grew with his neighbors and their problems. Part of him hoped they were all dead so this would be easier. Herkins, Benjamin called out. Get out of there. Briskin, you too, all of you. I want guns down and hands up. This is my property. Get out here. Soon he found them. There was Herkins and two more of his men. And then there was one of Briskin's men whom Benjamin caught attempting to flee but had been slowed down by a wounded horse. Over here, Benjamin forced the grumbling man, Tom Dallard, into the circle with the other men. Shooting? On my land? You're lucky I didn't finish you off myself. Herkins, you got one of your men killed. Dallard, where's Briskin? How many of you came? Herkins and his men were talking quietly over the dead body. They would have to take care of his body and let Albert's sister know. It wasn't supposed to happen like this, Herkins grumbled as they all came together. Blustering, the man picked up his hat as he straightened up. We were going to have a meeting, that's all. I was even thinking about asking for a truce. We're both getting up in years and... Dallard spat at their feet. A truce? The way you were shooting at us? Briskin nearly lost an arm. Benjamin raised his gun as a warning. Then he asked for clarification. Briskin is wounded? A the scowling man ducked his head, letting his stringy hair fall into his face. He avoided looking at the shotgun as he ground his teeth. Benjamin waited in case the man spat at him again. Though he wasn't certain he would shoot, he wanted to be prepared. Yeah, Dallard admitted a moment later. One bullet hit an artery. So one neighbor was seriously injured, and the other had lost a man in the rash battle. He tried to think through his options and what could be done. As much as he wanted to find the solution, he was having a hard time holding back his anger. They had been so careless. This was his home, his land, and that was his wife they had almost shot. We got him, Herkins cheered as he clapped his hands. Ha! Benjamin whirled around as Herkins and the youngest of the ranch hands cheered as well. You got him? He repeated angrily. You got him? You didn't kill him, Herkins. No, he killed one of your men. How can you cheer now before Albert? One minute you're planning his funeral and the next you're cheering? Think, men. How is any man worth a piece of land? The West may be wild, but it doesn't mean that we must be wild. The land you're fighting each other for isn't even yours. You can't have each other's land without taking mine. The river belongs to no one, though it falls directly on my property. I've been nice enough all these years to give you access to it. You, he gestured to Dallard as he created a solution. You are going to help them. He pointed to Herkins and his men. The three of you are going to take Albert's body to town, and then you are going to come straight back here, Herkins grunted. And me? Narrowing his eyes, Benjamin pursed his lips. You are going to stay right here, and you're not leaving until this feud ends once and for all. The older man huffed, showing the mean old crease in his jowls that he only shared when he was in a foul mood. Now see here, young man, this is none of your business. I told you I'd buy your land, but no, you didn't want to do that. All you're really doing is instigating more trouble. Try telling that to Albert's sister, Benjamin cut him off, not interested in false accusations or mean tempers. As his boss, you should be the one making amends with her. If you don't pay for his burial, I'll see you run out of town. Herkin's face turned red as he sputtered in disbelief. He looked around wildly with his frizzled hair as the other men ignored him and began to tend to Daniel Albert. Benjamin waited, watching as the man slowly slumped his shoulders. There was a loud gulp. Herkins fidgeted and then glanced up. Are you sure you don't want to sell me your land? I'm sure. Benjamin stepped closer, gauging the man's irritable mood. Glancing over his shoulder, he confirmed the others were loading Albert's body up to take into town. Once they were gone, he turned back to Herkins. Let's go for a walk, he said decidedly. 
He hoped the fresh air would give them both a fresh perspective with a solution in mind. It was also his best chance to talk the man out of committing such dangerous action in the future. The two men made it to the river where it looked like nothing had happened. Benjamin set up the problem and offered ideas. Herkins wasn't much help, but with some convincing, he was more obliging to finding a solution. Benjamin, Ben. He turned to hear Beverly's voice calling for him. As he did, she appeared from the trees sitting astride Chief. It softened the harsh mood for just a second. Her eyes were bright as she clambered off her horse and ran to him. She was a blur before reaching his arms. Caught off guard, Ben nearly fell over. Instinctively, he wrapped his arms around her. She was warm with her chest heaving against his. But as quickly as she had hugged him, she pulled away. I thought, when I couldn't find you, she stammered before stepping back. Her cheeks heated up as Herkins peered at her curiously. Why did you leave? Ben glanced around, though it was difficult to take his eyes off his wife. She had windswept hair with a wild look in her eyes. There was something about her that made him forget for a second what was happening. Leave? I'm right here. You left the... Oh, never mind. She threw her hands up in frustration before clasping them over her heart. What are you two doing here? Herkins tried to dissuade her from learning of their conversation, saying it was no matter for a woman. That, of course, only made her desire to know more. Benjamin reluctantly laid out the details. Well, we met the men with the body on the way. Briskin is going to be arrested for murder, she informed them. Beverly caught her breath and added, The sheriff said he has no family, so the land will go up for sale. Benjamin turned to Herkins, who was so surprised his eyes nearly popped out of his head before he shouted in victory. Woo! I got me my land after all! No, you don't. Beverly cut him off short to both of their surprise. After all this trouble you caused, the sheriff has half a mind to put you in jail. No, you won't be doing any such thing. Benjamin glared at the old man, who growled, You can't stop me. Oh, there's no need! Beverly took a deep breath as she fixed the wrinkles in her dress and smiled proudly. There's already been an offer. Who? Herkins thundered as Benjamin slowly realized what was happening. He shifted, his eyes slipping down to her plump, smirking lips. Beverly. I did, she announced. Benjamin and I will be purchasing that land. One way or another, it will be ours, not yours, Herkins. Also, we're limiting your access to the river. The old man was going red in the face with the effort to resist talking and constrain himself from tackling her. Benjamin stepped between them, but he was confounded himself. Are you sure we want that? he asked her. She nodded before narrowing her eyes at the old man. Bad choices deserve a punishment, and you, sir, made a terrible one. After what you've done? You've trespassed on our property. You've gotten one of your ranch hands killed. You ruined a perfectly good picnic, and you nearly got my husband killed. Benjamin jerked his head up. He had forgotten about his arm. Glancing down, he winced to find it was bleeding again. But Beverly had turned into a very driven woman. He had never seen anything like her before and couldn't help but be impressed by her and attracted. There was nothing more Herkins could say, especially as the sheriff arrived. Benjamin watched him talk with Beverly as though they were old friends. It sent a wave of irritation through him until she stepped over to check his shoulder. Oh dear, she pouted upon brushing a finger softly against his skin. He couldn't stop himself from flinching, but he was fine and wanted to show her that was the case. That's what I get for taking you on a picnic. His eyes followed Herkins, who headed off with the sheriff. She flicked his arm lightly. Ow! Don't tease me when you're injured, she ordered him. I don't like worrying about you. The corners of his lips twitched as Benjamin looked down at Beverly. She was almost as annoying as she was beautiful. And clever. She was terribly clever. No? Then you married the wrong man. He couldn't resist teasing her. I'm a very dangerous man. That made her laugh, just as he had hoped. Oh, hardly. And I'm not sure if there's anyone else I'd rather... Well... Beverly stopped short, inhaling deeply as he realized what she was about to say. Her eyes dropped away as she bit her lip. It was too late. He knew exactly what she was thinking, and he had the very same thought. Good. He smirked when she looked up. I don't think I could stand anyone else. 
You're more than enough for me. Before she could object, he stepped forward and looped his arms around her. She responded readily as though she'd been waiting for him. Her arms wrapped around his waist and she stood on her toes as he leaned down to kiss her. He wasn't certain what had changed between them or when, but he was glad that it had. Now there weren't any more people shooting at them or trying to steal his wife. The prospect of spending the rest of his life squabbling with Beverly sounded like a wonderful thing, and he couldn't wait to enjoy it, especially with the occasional kiss. Epilogue It was springtime again. Beverly finished washing the bowls from their morning porridge. Her eyes lifted again to the window, seeing how bright the sun shone before them. The snow was melting in the fields, though it would take another month or so for the ice to melt off the mountains. But that meant more fresh water in the streams, and she was grateful for that. There were a lot of things to be grateful for that morning. She had slept well and through the night. Even when Benjamin had risen early, she hadn't even noticed him leaving her side. Though the bed felt a little colder without him, she'd had the time to relax for a little longer. She had slept well, eaten well, and now there was a beautiful day before her. After she dried her hands on her apron, Beverly stepped out of the house and onto the porch to get a better look at the world before her. And at the bottom of the steps, she found her husband doing the same. He was still as handsome as the day they met. She grinned. Her heart still fluttered when she saw him. The man looked very much the same, though she had managed to fatten him up a little bit. It had taken some time, but it was worth it. His shirt collar was loose around his neck, a soft breeze tickling his throat. She wondered what he saw when he looked ahead. Did he see everything she did? Did he see more or less? It was a beautiful home. Colorado was a wilderness that she couldn't get enough of, and his little ranch had grown into something quite impressive. Only a mile to the west stood another home that housed all the men who worked on the ranch now. After all, it was all too much just for the two of them. She had bargained with the sheriff and town officials for a reasonable price on Briskin's property two years ago. It had been purchased before the harvest ended, and she helped Ben hire a foreman. There were eight men lodging in that home now. They were already considering hiring two more ranch hands, along with a cook. Though she prepared an evening meal for everyone at the end of the day and their foreman, Gerald, picked it up and delivered it to the men, she couldn't go on that way forever. What's on your mind? She glanced down to find Benjamin had turned to look up at her. Smiling, she beckoned him to join her. I was going to ask you the same thing, Beverly announced. Did you say hello to Chief for me? I did, he assured her. And you gave him an extra sugar cube? I did not. The moment he reached her side, she elbowed him. I asked you to do that. It's a simple enough task, isn't it? Benjamin chuckled before wrapping an arm around her. Certainly, but he's getting fat, so he's not getting any sugar until he loses his winter weight. His arm felt right when it was snug around her shoulders. He was warm and comforting, a reminder that he was her strong protector. And yet it wasn't limiting, only comforting. She could protect herself. But it didn't hurt to have him by her side. She really liked it, rather. She really liked him. Most days, Beverly was even certain that she loved her husband. It was an exquisite feeling that made her feel as though she could fly. So Beverly leaned into his arms, resting her head on his shoulder. Perhaps I should go riding then, she said decidedly. His chuckle rumbled in his chest, making her grin. She tried to hide it. I don't think so, Ben informed her. Not for another four months, the doctor said. But I'm thinking six, maybe eight, or even a year. Snorting, she rolled her eyes. Don't be ridiculous. You're carrying a child, he reminded her. My child. And mine, she added, before he could say anything more. So you're not riding until you're able, Ben declared obstinately. Then he reached forward to lay his hand on her stomach. It had felt strange when he started to do such a thing. But as the baby within her grew, she found herself craving his touch even more. A smile slipped over her face as she placed her hands over his and moved them to the side where the baby had kicked. 
It was only a few weeks until she expected to be carrying the babe in her arms, or even sooner, if he kept moving around so much. I'm always able, she informed him, but her voice had dropped its volume with a soft sigh. He's going to be a beautiful boy. He kissed the back of her head. It could be a girl, you know, a girl as stubborn as yourself. That made her laugh as she leaned back. His arm around her tightened its grip. She looked up and made a face at him. It's a boy. I know it. Oh? She nodded, realizing she hadn't told him about that dream. It had been an echo in her mind ever since she had it, even before she and her husband were ever this close. But she knew it was true with all her heart. I dreamed of him, Beverly admitted, though she knew how silly it would sound. Years ago, during our first summer together, it feels like a lifetime ago, but I remember how real it felt. I could feel it in my bones, Ben. We had a family, and, and he was there. He had all these toys and a sweet little cradle. And everywhere I looked, there you were. Then our little boy was in your arms. He's going to have your eyes. Beverly shifted so she could turn around to look him in the eye. She squinted up at him before shifting his hat back so she could see him better. He raised an eyebrow at her teasingly. No matter what was going on, he knew just how to make her smile. He's going to be as clever as you then, Ben supposed, and twice as annoying. She giggled. With us as his parents? Oh, he'll be just terrible. We are in for quite the ride of our lives. He gave her a dramatic sigh. Then at least I'm doing it with you. That should make it more interesting. Before she could laugh, a yawn escaped her lips. Oh, very. And then another yawn. Benjamin took his chance to fix his hat and then turn her towards the door. Looks like it's time for your morning nap. Inside you go, Bev. Back to bed. No, she moaned. I wanted to be productive. I'm not done knitting that blanket yet. But even as she talked, Beverly slowly started towards the house. Then she glanced behind her when Ben stayed put. What are you doing? His eyes lifted to meet hers with a smirk. You're cute when you waddle. Somehow, he could still make her blush bright red like a new bride. Don't be so obnoxious. Come help me up the step. You can make it up the step, he chuckled as he stepped forward to obey. You're just not supposed to ride a horse or overextend yourself. But making this step is overextending myself, she pouted as she stopped at the door. Then she rubbed her large belly with both her hands. It's so high. Ben opened the door and gave her a dramatic bow. It's just one step. You ran up the stairs just yesterday. Yes, but only because the pie was burning she reminded him pointedly. Then she gripped his shoulder for balance and stepped up into the house. And you wouldn't listen to me. I was in the barn, he rolled his eyes as he followed her through the house. They made it through the hall and then turned right towards the bedroom. And I couldn't hear what you were shouting. You were like a madwoman. That made her scoff. You're ridiculous. He scoffed as well in mockery of her as they reached the bedroom. And you're just trying to argue about anything. Because I'm tired, she pouted as she sat down. Then she held up one foot so he could help her with it. At first, she had been rather embarrassed at not being able to put her shoes on and off by herself. But Benjamin had taken to the task commendably, and she was relieved of it. And besides, she reminded him, that's what you love about me. He scoffed again as he took off her right shoe and then her left shoe. Not sure arguments are that lovable. Relationships are supposed to be about agreement, not arguments. As if we've ever cared what other people do. She rolled her eyes before sighing in relief. Her feet ached so much lately. For the last two months, wearing shoes had become a daily misery. But now, she was free. Beaming, she wiggled her toes at Benjamin. Rolling his eyes, he tugged her ankles over onto the bed. This easily set off her balance, so she had to fall into the blankets. Immediately, she stole Benjamin's pillow and hugged it close. The pillow smelled just like him. I'll stop arguing if you join me for my nap, she promised him. But he shook his head. I have to go talk to Gerald. Besides, last time I did, you wouldn't fall asleep. Because I had a lot to say. But I'll be quiet this time, she offered playfully with her most winning smile. Maybe I'll even play nice and not argue. Not till supper time, even. It's so much easier to sleep with you here. 
I'm sure it is, he offered as he leaned down to kiss her forehead, but that will have to wait. I need to work, get some rest, and we'll argue later. She groaned. But what if I want to argue now? That made him laugh. You just said you would stop arguing. I know, she started thinking quickly, but but taking naps is so boring, and before she could say anything more, Benjamin bent over again, and this time he kissed her on her lips. He was warm and tasted like sunshine. Beverly immediately wrapped her arms around him, grinning. Her heart skipped a beat with him so close. One of his hands caressed her cheek, and she could feel the child within her practically skipping. She couldn't picture a more perfect moment, though something told her that there would be many more of those to come. A Tormented Bride for the Courageous Cowboy Story is available on our website and on Amazon. Read or listen it now. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.